The title match is underway here in the 2023 Champions Chess Tour Final. It's Magnus Carlsen versus Wesley So in a rematch of their round robin battle earlier this week, where despite epic chess from both players in the end, it was Wesley So, the underdog, who took home the victory over the world number one. Will he be all smiles again here today at the end of the title match? We'll find out because the show starts right now. I think I uh, you've heard the sayings, the road less traveled, rubber meets the road, I'm on the road to nowhere. That need to get up and go, to just shut up and drive to parts of unknown. It's in our DNA. But this road has an end. And the beginning? Well, let's throw that in reverse. It's over. We have a winner, Magnus Carlson. What has this kid got in store? He might I have to win. Checkmate. There's been curves, hills, corners, and even a breakdown or two. The game is over. That's a wrap. We see a reaction. Magnus oh! Mouse oh! Magnus Mouse lift. Oh my Please gosh. Look at Jordan's face. Some have pulled over, but some. Oh, oh what? what is he doing? Slammed that foot to the floor and just kept going. Any second now? Yes. Nakamura is the winner. Not a big of the from Maxim Vajilagrav, the Frenchman. He wins the A. After six stops along the way, it's time for the greatest proving ground in online chess to drop that final pin in the GPS. Destination, Toronto, Canada. Eight players from all four corners of the globe descend on the Queen City with one goal to prove who the one true king of online chess really is. I think this is the strongest final there's ever been. I know that it will not be easy. It's nice to play in top tournament. Magnus will want revenge. It's my last tournament of the year. I'm a bit desperate to end it well. It's having the opportunity to play against the best players in the world. It's always a challenge and I enjoy it. It's going to be a very close fight. It's going to be very exciting. Live from Toronto, Canada, this is the 2023 Champions Chess Tour Finals and it starts now. Well, he may be desperate to end it well. Wesley So is gonna have a chance to do so as we look across the beautiful Lake Ontario one of the largest lakes in North America, and you see the CN Tower. She's always there gazing upon the entire city. As fans will gaze upon the chess here in Toronto, it is time for the title match, the 2023 Champions Chess Tour Final. This is what we've been waiting for. Danny Wrench, James Canty, Levy Rosman. Guys, you can feel the energy. You can feel the nerves. The semis are done. Levy, your first thoughts on the my, final? We made it. My first thoughts are if you combine that top and that top, you get me. I, wow. I like that. Look at that. We Look at that. Color -coded. You know color -coded. Color -coded. I, did, was that was, did we plan that? We did, yeah, we actually. Did. We, we did not. Plan that. Spend but more time I together. Am, yeah. I'm pumped. We have an opportunity to see a revenge Magnus beating everybody in the round robin stage except Wesley So, who mm. went perfect to start 6 0, obviously succumbing to the uh, last round of Fabiano Caruana. But Magnus out for revenge. Yeah. We have two days of action. This is an amazing matchup because yeah. Wesley has had success yeah. against Magnus in Rapid this year. So, Wesley. Wesley. Let's go. And you know, Wesley in Toronto, in fact, you know, hence the name Flexley Serrano, right? He actually, it's proven fact he gets 100 ELO when he's here in Toronto only. So, you got GOAT, and then you have, you know, Wesley So, who's on 100 ELO just because he's in Toronto. Toronto how he did performs. you prepare that run? I did. That was did. hot. Thank you. That was hot. It. I I'm Wesley So on 100 plus saying. ELO because he's in really Toronto. To Let's go. <laughs> the show flow moves across to the bracket. Let's remind everybody of how they got here. The semis were exciting. Wesley So fell behind Abdu Saturov, if you forgot that. He had to complete a comeback, and that's what gave us a very long day of chess yesterday. Magnus Carlsen won, but it took Armageddon twice. Will we look back on that matchup with Caruana and say that that was actually the toughest, closest match? Or will Wesley So do what he's done before and beat Magnus Carlsen in a match, not just here, but many remember the 2019 Fisher Random World Championship? 
oh man, these guys are are uh, are out for blood, you know, because I think Magnus doesn't like the fact that some people think Wesley mm-hmm. can beat him in this format. I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Oh, definitely. I mean, Magnus, you know, he, he was showing up early. I want to hear y'all predictions just to make sure you're predicting against me yeah. so I can use that, right? Yeah. So and the world, like, hey, we, we're rooting for Wesley, right? But, of course, Magnus is like, yeah, I want you to root for Wesley. Yeah. That's, that's what I needed today, that motivation. I will say, uh, and to the fans at home who, who are aware, this is very much a situation where the world knows who the favorite is right. based on past experience. It's almost like a Djokovic showing up to yeah. a final. Yeah. The yeah. whole tournament, we're sitting going, is he going to make the final? Well, now he's in the final. Mm. Yeah. And we see his opponent almost feels like, even though we are all fans of Magnus and probably Wesley, we're secretly kind of rooting for Wesley for a big <laughs> upset here. Just, 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 a, just a little chaos. We all love chaos. We all want a little right. drama, a little, a little chaos at the top. <laughs> Look, we had drama yesterday as well. We talked about how they got there with the bracket we showed you. Let's give you a little bit of a highlight reel of how things went down. The stage is set for the deciding match of the Champions Chess Tour Finals. The finalists, Magnus Carlsen and Wesley So, are no strangers to each other on the world stage. Historically, Magnus has been the dominant player. In classical chess, their record is five wins for Magnus, one win for Wesley, and 15 draws. Wesley is a three-time US chess champion and a former Fisher Random world champion, defeating Magnus to claim the inaugural title in 2019. Last year, he won the Chess.com Global Championship, also hosted in Toronto. While an impressive achievement, there was one player missing from those finals, Magnus Carlsen. The current world number one and highest rated player ever, the name needs almost no introduction. The five-time world chess champion, many consider Magnus to be the greatest chess player ever. After two days and four rounds, Wesley and Magnus were the only ones with perfect scores going into their match against one another. After two accurate draws, it was Wesley that took it home in Armageddon, winning with a bold sacrifice early on. The round robin finished with Wesley and Magnus in first and second respectively allowing them to skip the survival stage. The winners to emerge from the survival stage were Fabiano Caruana and Noderbeck Abdusatorov. Wesley had a choice in opponent for the semifinal, and wanting to avoid the world number two, he chose Noderbeck. This made for a 2018 World Chess Championship rematch with Magnus and Fabiano. After trading wins with the white pieces, Fabiano stole a game with the black pieces. All he needed to secure the first set was a draw with white, but Magnus had other ideas. An early blunder from Fabi spelt the end of that game and set one was sent to Armageddon. Despite Magnus' winning position with the black pieces, he used his draw odds to his advantage and went for a forced repetition line spotted miles away. Fabiano spotted it too, but in his effort to avoid it, his position worsened, ending in a win for Magnus. He could just throw in the towel. Magnus Carlsen, brilliant tactical awareness to take this Armageddon. That is set one to Magnus. Set two was just as heartbreaking for Fabiano, losing an Armageddon once again, marking the end of his run here in Toronto. In the other semifinal, Wesley started out strong, winning the first game of set one. Noterback then came back winning the next two games, showing incredible poise in critical moments with mere seconds on the clock. In the fourth game, Noterback found a threefold repetition to get a draw and win the set. The next day, Wesley came out swinging, winning the first two games of the set. Noterback found a win on demand with the black pieces in the next game, but drew the last one to lose the set. Tied at one set apiece, the pair entered into a final best of two set to determine who would go to the finals. After two tense draws, we were treated to one last Armageddon for the day. With immense pressure and $50,000 on the line for a single game, Noterbeck succumbed to nerves and time pressure, allowing Wesley to find a winning end game with a massive time advantage. He's got no time as well and lost on the board. These are the final few seconds of Noderbeck in the Champions Chess Tour Finals. And the Queen can take this night. A new Queen will appear. Noderbeck knows it. He resigns. Wesley So is in to the finals. Great match. It's been a grueling week of rapid chess in Toronto. One match remains to determine a winner at the Champions Chess Tour Finals. Who will it be? Magnus Carlsen or Wesley So? I think that was a proper tribute, a proper homage to the players who are no longer with us in Toronto. Love those shots of them exiting the door, but it's down to two. Down to two. It's down to two. Yeah. It's Magnus, it's Wesley. Wesley. 
We start with the GOAT. Your thoughts, yeah. Magnus. Well, Magnus always wants to win. We know that. Not only in just the mental, but the physical. I actually saw him at the gym yesterday. Like, okay. literally, I was just go, you know, going to the restroom, and the gym's right there. He was walking into, into the gym to work out. And I was like, wow, the mental and the physical's there. As Wesley so even mentioned as well, too. He was like, yeah, you know, he's just a little bit more fit at the top level. And you can see that. And then he went out to the Leafs game to see some other guys do their thing. Magnus is ready to go at all levels. Magnus also has said frequently that he thinks Fabiano Caruana is the, num the clear number two in the world. And he might feel like he already got the job done. And Wesley is sort of the, the next in line. He might feel like it's a little bit of a weight off his shoulders. We see the head-to-head. -head. They have played so many freaking games against each other. 31-17 yeah. is wild. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> a 39 it's a draws is wild. Well, 39 well. draws is wild, yeah. But of course, uh, they, they've played, uh, let's quick, quick math, 87 games of Rapid is yeah. what that was. And, and remember, fans, that stat was just Rapid. Yeah, yeah, it's just rapid. It's not classical. It's not classical. Not bliss, he's yeah. played so many times. And right. I, I, a better stat is what is Wesley's win percentage in all three types of formats? I, it, that that was that was thirty one seventeen. So yeah, that's like a it's good convincing. that's a good basketball team. Yeah, you know, you it's know. like a third place basketball team right there. <laughs> Wesley's beaten him seventeen times, <laughs> and this year he's beaten him a couple of times as well. So yeah. we'll see which Wesley shows up. Magnus is doing Magnus things. We'll see which Wesley shows up to battle Magnus. Let's remind everybody of all those Magnus things that he has done here through the first six days in Toronto. A 7-3 and three record overall in his, uh, in his white and black games there. Misread that one, but I want to jump to the brilliancies, by the way. He's played eight of them. Wow, that's tied for most with Wesley So That's a fun little stat right there. Crazy. A 5-1 and one Armageddon overall record. Candy? Biggest stat that jumps out to you uh, on he, the Magnus scoreboard. That 5-1. to one, That 5-1 to one overall is the biggest for me. I mean, obviously, the eight brilliant season is nasty, too. But that 5-1. to one, And guess who gave him that one? Danny. Oh, that's right. It was Wesley. Ah. Yeah. The question is always, can you stop Magnus? Wesley has done it already once Correct. today. But now more games in the match. Yep. We heard Hikaru on his way out say that if Magnus gets more games, yeah. it's obviously more of an opportunity yeah. for him to make a comeback if he goes down in a match or if the yeah. match is tied. We saw it against Fabiano. He did come but back. I'm going to go back to the fact that that match was a barn burner. Two times it went to Armageddon versus right. Fabiano, and Magnus still managed to overcome. Yeah. And Wesley roaring back against Nodjerbeck. I mean, it's pretty clear both of these guys deserve to be here. Yeah. yeah. So now we're just going to have to see who the Which champ one? is. Who the champ? Right. the champ is here. These guys do deserve to be here. We're happy you're in here with us. Another person who's in here with us right now is Kaya. She's been patiently waiting for a chance to jump in. So, Kaya, good morning. Hey, Kaya. Morning, Kaya. Good morning, Danny. Yeah, it's uh, patiently is the word. I mean, these chairs are so comfortable you can fall asleep here i don't know how the players sit here for such a long time just so energetic and that's what it's all about today you know we started out back in january with hundreds of players in the first qualification we took the top eight players here to toronto they have been fighting it out now since saturday we are now left with two chairs two players to fight it out for the ultimate title and well magnus carlson he is now known as the goat after traveling around for chess for many years now and asking the question who is the best chess player of all time so many times i heard people answer gary kasparov gary kasparov but more often now over the last few years people start answering magnus carlson and uh, let's hear what the other players here in toronto said about magnus carlson before the tournament started uh, so first of all, what is your take on Magnus Carlsen? Growing up, he was my idol because when I started playing chess, he became world champion in 2013. It's always pretty cool. I play against him and I'm happy that I managed to be quickly in the top so I could compete against him. So he's really exceptional player and uh, an amazing champion. I mean, he's still is the best player by far, I would say. Uh, I don't think he's... Uh, motivated in chess as he once used to be. And Magnus Carlsen is, uh, of course, he's incredibly strong. It's very hard to play against him. Well, Magnus Carlsen um, could definitely be considered the greatest player of all time, or at least in a close battle with, uh, with Gary Kasparov. Yeah, it'll be interesting to play against him, see his form, um, and hopefully at least some of us can put up a good fight and maybe, maybe beat him. Uh, the difference between me and Magnus was uh, like 300 tour points, so it means uh, it means a lot. So I think that speaks for itself, uh, as people like to say. He's admired by his peers. He's feared by his peers. Right. They uh, they look at his chess and they look at what he does. They're always impressed. 
Magnus Carlsen, larger than life in many ways, larger than chess. And speaking of larger than just the chess in here, we now have a fan zone that we got to check in oh, yeah. with. Pants. The chess bras okay. are going to be holding zone. it down live at a bar not too far from here. There are already fans in there. We see a few of them. I think there's, uh, there's a lot of fans in there. We're, we're, we're seeing through. Like, oh, somebody's filming right there. Eric and Amon are going to be hosting. If you're looking for a different flavor of go. commentary, you can head over to the Chess Broad channel as they will have the call with a lot of fans who will probably have a great and a safe time. Is that Aryan Tari right there? That is. That's Aryan Tari right there. Is that there. a grandmaster? Is that a, that is a Norwegian grandmaster. But All right, those are the fans who are here to cheer for Magnus. Well, guess what? Last night, Magnus Carlsen was a fan as he went to the Leafs game. And uh, he was cheering for a score that it didn't look like they were having a great time. I mean, just look at that. They were down 5-0. Yep. I'm sure they were having fun anyway. But, Levy, uh, tell the fans if they missed it, what happened in that one? Yeah, that's all I saw. I, I did not actually see the update until this morning. I thought this was hilarious. You know, you take Magnus Carlson to a suite in a hockey game, and the, you know, the home team's down 5 nothing. Well, the Toronto Maple Leafs scored five goals in the third period, which... Sources have told us has never been done before, but there's going to be hockey fans in the chat that might disagree or we are just totally wrong. The, the Toronto Maple Leafs score five goals in the third period to tie the score and then lose in overtime. Oh, man. Perfect, hurts. perfect strategy for a Toronto hockey team. Perfect strategy. <laughs> they, they, you know, they lose in overtime. You do get points for going for overtime, but all right, we're, we're overtime right now on Magnus. It's time for us to move across to Wesley. So, and I'm going to, you're the guy who gives him the nickname yeah, yeah, yeah. who Wesley just. Serrano. Seen it, you've seen him do it now of two course. years in a row. Absolutely. Your thoughts? Well, 100%. I mean, last year when he did win, you know, the CGC, I mean, the big money prize there, all the players he had to go through, and it was very, very strong field. I mean, you see him here in Toronto. He feels so good. You can tell he's in great spirits. And he does get that extra 100 ELO that carries over from last year yeah. just because of what he did last year in Toronto. He already took out Magnus, too, as well. I mean, uh, he's trying to do it again. Yep. And here's how he got there. If you uh, forgot, he did it in comeback fashion over Noterbeck of Dusaturov. He was down, but he showed up on Thursday. Not one, but two, three, really, if you consider the Armageddon matches. And uh, Levy, back to you. Your thoughts on Wesley So and whether that chess has a chance to continue now that he's facing Carlson. Listen, Toronto has been his city. Last year, he knocks out Hikaru, and then he wins the entire thing. This time, he's the top seed. He chooses Nodjebek Abdusatorov. He makes it as dramatic as possible, so we get more viewership. He wins the Armageddon after <laughs> you know an eight-match I mean? day. Crazy. He picked his opponent, and right. he got he got he sent Magnus the hardest opponent yeah. he could possibly find. Magnus overcame the challenge, so yeah. now Wesley's going to have to take down Magnus. That'd be some epic stuff. I, I love the call there because as, as a guy who's been accused of scripting a few things in the chess world, I will say that if you were to script some content in terms of how Magnus Carlsen falls behind against Fabiano Caruana, not once but twice. Right. Epic comeback in Armageddon. I guess Fabi sent the, sent the second one yeah. Armageddon. And then Wesley So finds a way to give us the most possible chess he could. The round robin where they threw down, speaking of giving all that he could to chess, was a big match because Wesley So, after losing an Armageddon bid, quote unquote losing, Magnus won black, Wesley blew him off the board. Yeah, he sacrificed a knight, a pawn, a, a rook. rook, right? He, he, yeah, <laughs> the rook, you, you didn't scream it. No, I didn't scream it. You know, I'm trying to save my voice for the screams a little bit later. Okay. But, uh, incredible game. His six, his six days in Toronto, we have there up on the screen. I mean, he's tied with the most brilliancies with Magnus. That's, that's really all we got to look at. They should have just put that bullet point up on the screen. And, uh, yeah, he's the only one to defeat Magnus in a match here in Toronto. This looks exactly the same. I mean, I was looking, I was like, <laughs> yeah, is they, like, <laughs> did they change it, production? No, it's exactly, it's the oh, same as Magnus. Five and one in Armageddon. I mean, it's, it's crazy. They're the same person in a different universe. Yeah. Spider-Man meme. It, it, I mean, Candy, you're making a great point. It, the stats are just strikingly similar, right? I mean, they have both played the best chess of any two people, and I guess that's why they're still here <laughs> standing. And still here with us inside the playing hall is Kaya. She's been waiting again to weigh in on So. Kaya, what you got for us? Yep, still here. Dan is still in this comfortable secret lab chair. And I'm sitting by one of the boards. So we started off, obviously, with four tables, four boards. Uh, today, there will only be play on one board. This is not the board. So that means I'm allowed to touch the pieces. I'm not going to screw up any DGT stuff here. And it's going to be interesting, right, to see when the players come. They always uh, organize their pieces the way they want it. Shadub, Magnus Carlsen, always... Puts his knights like this. Wesley so, however, he likes to have them facing towards the heart. Both knights facing like this. So this is what Wesley will do when he comes to the board today to play the first game with the white pieces. He is the top seed, remember. So I want to ask you guys, what do you think will be the first move in the big final when Wesley so has the, the white pieces in game one? 
It's hard to guess first moves, but I'm going to guess that he doesn't play 1E4. He struggled with 1E4 against Notre Dame Abusa Turoff. A couple of his losses came with that, and he told me hanging on the lounge that he was not too happy with the opening there. So will he play 1B3? I guess I'll guess that for funsies. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think we're going to see E4. Wow, that's, that's a good, uh, good, good observation. I actually thought he would play E4 because of based off the interview that you gave with him, and he was like, yeah, you know, favorite opening. He said E4. I was like, oh, cool, E4. So feels like that, but you have a great point. He just didn't do well with E4 against Abusa Turoff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to predict that E4, you don't know if Magnus will play E5 or C5. Mm. E5 is symmetrical. It's going to be a, a, a Spanish or an Italian, and he will ease into the match. Or Magnus could just show up guns blazing with a Sicilian. Right. Right. And I, I kind of feel like Wesley might want to ease into it and play a D4 because that kind of controls the action. We're going to mm. get a traditional Queen's pawn, the D and C pawns. But, mm. I mean, he might show up and do whatever he wants. So, yeah. But my guess yeah. is D4. I like that take, though. If he doesn't want to fight in game one, maybe avoid E4 because of the Sicilian. Kaya, what do you think? No, I'm just going to say what I'm hoping for, and that is exact same as you, Danny. I'm hoping for the B3. I love that opening. So much fun. And Wesley So, well, he is here, ready to fight. This means so much to Wesley So to be able to fight for it and maybe have the chance to win the Champions Chess Tour 2023. We did sit down with him before the tournament to talk about what's at stake here. So we are here in Toronto. I am uh, Kaya, excited for the CCT Finals here with Wesley So. Nice to be here in Toronto. Yes, good. To, I'm also very excited. And it's good to see you back after such a long time. Only eight of you made it here yeah. to Toronto. So what makes you excited? I did very well last year. Yeah. Hopefully it's a good sign. And uh, it's the same place. You know, this one, my most favorite hotel from last year. So hopefully that's a good sign. What are uh, the stands in for this week? You know, things are going to happen very quickly. Right from the very beginning, there's a lot in stake here. So players are going to be very competitive. And uh, obviously, some time ago, you learned that the finals would be over the board. What was your reaction to that? In, I don't know if you know, but we're playing in a computer, right? No, no, we're playing over the board. Oh, we're playing in a real board? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you're learning that now. Yeah, I was quite confused. I don't know what Magnus <laughs> has been doing <laughs> playing online all this time then. <laughs> Wait, okay, so yeah. thank you. Yeah. Can you describe your playing style? When I was younger, I would always play 1e4 and play the Sicilian with black. Like, I was very aggressive. I'd go for mating attacks, but I could not play the end game. And then when I turned 16, I started reading a lot of opening books. And then when I reached 2600, I realized that you cannot just go for the attack every single game and hope to win because 2600s are not stupid. They will, they will bring you down. Mm. And what would it mean to, to, to win it, uh, Wesley? It would be amazing. Uh, it, my last term of the year, it's really it's really a big deal. Uh, this year is much stronger though than last year. You got Magnus, you got Sati, you got Hikaru. So there's a lot in stake. Wesley So, thank you and good luck in the CCT Finals. Yes. Well, we know how much he would want to win. And here are the odds for him to win, according to the Chess.com stats team at this point, based on a, a long and lengthy kind of probability algorithm simulation. I'm not going to tell you how we arrived at this, because I think most people tend to agree with it. Magnus was a 50% favorite coming in, Wesley 7. Now it's a, it's a, it's a quarter percent, 25% chance, according to 75%. But all right, there's a chance both players are about to come in right now, and they typically like to get ready. So I think... I think we're going to get out of here. Let's throw it across the sea, the Atlantic, to Tanya, Robert, and David. We know you guys are waiting. You're as excited, I'm sure, as we are to see what action goes down on the board. So, Tanya, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Danny, and super excited about everything that's coming up. We've been building up to this moment all year round, the fight for the championship, and it is between the two best performers. The top two finishers of the round robin is the world champion taking on the global champion, clash of the titans, however you look at it. How does Wesley defy those odds today, Robert? Well, we've been really waiting for this clash for over a year since Wesley So took down the 2022 Chess.com Global Champion. And Magnus Carlsen won the 2022 Champions Chess Tour. So these two players, they came in as defending champions. Only one of them can escape and keep their crown. Who will it be, Wesley or Magnus? I think Magnus has to be the favorite, as I always say, but Wesley will give him all he can handle. 
Yeah, it feels like a unification match in some way, and uh, it's just a tantalizing prospect. If we see anything like the chess we saw uh, when these two met in the round robin stage, then I'm going to get my popcorn out and just enjoy. But yes, Magnus, I think undoubtedly, even uh, Wesley So will admit he starts as the favorite, but he cannot relax. One move, one slip up, and Wesley will be ready to punish him. Magnus Carlsen, it's hard to bet against the world number one, regardless of who he's playing. And we had such a big semi-final battle. Both Magnus and Wesley put on this phenomenal fight. For Wesley, it went down to the wire. Magnus was able to wrap it up without a set three. Do you think stamina fatigue is a factor at this point? Well, I feel like that Magnus match in some ways was just as close as the Wesley So win over Nodirbek Abusatara because Magnus won in two consecutive Armageddons. It was tied two games apiece. Fabiano actually took three decisive games off of Magnus. Not something that many people can say in this world. So both players will be exhausted. It's the seventh day of an eight-day stretch here. So I think that both players will have to uh, give all that's left in the reserve tank. And Wesley So did get the job done against Magnus Carlsen in the round robin. He it went all the way to the Armageddon, but Wesley, with probably one of the best played games of the final so far, he took the match in that one. He's got to find that same chess, that same provocative, aggressive play as he did in that one, uh, David. That was a memorable encounter. Wesley throwing sacrifices out there, going straight directly for Magnus's king. He needs more of the same. He cannot be too deferential here. He cannot give Magnus too much respect. It's going to be a long match mm. over today and tomorrow. But Wesley will need to take his chances. He will need to uh, show that same level of attack, of aggression uh, that he displayed in that one game. Yeah, that move, knight to g5. What a move that was finishing uh, the game in the Armageddon, at least starting the attack and eventually finishing the game. Now, for Wesley, it's a big question, right? It was a different format in the round robin. It was a, a shorter format with just two rapid games going into Armageddon. This is a best of three set. And today, set one. Are we expecting Wesley in a best of four match to take a more cagey approach? Or does he, as David was saying, Go, go for it. Take, make the most of the opportunities from the very start against Magnus. If I'm Wesley So, I go with my tried and true method. I play solidly against this man right here. World number one, <laughs> Magnus Carlsen. Doesn't matter if he's out late watching hockey. He always brings it on the chessboard. You see the players? They're about to get set. We will see Wesley's opening approach in just a few seconds. Will it be the King Spawn opening or the Queen Spawn opening or how Kaya predicted? Perhaps we might see another 1v3. I'd be surprised if you see another cowboy chess here. Thank you so yep. much for Wesley, coming. so he starts with white. Ready, set, go. We're off. And it's the finals, the Champions Chess Tour 2023. Glasses off, business time. Wesley, so... He's got to choose his first move. Which pawn? It's the title match. He does adjust Jadup the king. And it is 1v3. <laughs> Magnus Carlsen shakes his head. He is surprised. I, Magnus was not expecting this. I can't tell if he's more surprised or offended. B3 <laughs> is not an opening you see at the highest levels of chess, at least not in this time control. You usually see it in blitz chess. But Magnus probably didn't take it so seriously, considering Wesley, he seemed to use it just to get something. But Magnus has not even played his very first move. Wow, not many people in world chess have the courage to uh, play this type of opening against Magnus Carlsen. Usually they're trying to occupy the center, trying to force the issue. And look at Magnus, he's bemused. He's uh, just shocked here, looking up at the ceiling, just trying to pick uh, how to react to this shock, this surprise. And eventually he plays a bit of copycat, mirror image here. He gets re ready to fear in Keto. Black start square bishop playing at g6, the knight out. And will Wesley take this knight? Big stylistic choice, white is flexible. No, he just pushes a pawn and, okay, we see the first mind games at work. And Magnus Carlsen himself has uh, employed uh, 1b3 with the white side. Definitely something that, yes, Wesley won a game against Nodebek Abdul Satrov in the semifinals, but nobody could have expected this seriously to happen against. We were talking about this being the anti-young player chess approach in the opening. The guy Wesley's facing right now is not exactly a young player. <laughs> well, he could, you could argue, still be in his prime. And I can't believe that I, of all people, am about to say this. 
did Magnus prepare by looking at Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it? The answer is likely no. But Wesley asked the question, what should I do? He posed that question to Fabiano Caruana, and Fabi said the key to playing Magnus, jokingly, is to prepare for and against 1B3. So we have that opening on the board. We're going to have Fien Keto from both of Black's bishops on the longest diagonals, and Wesley... He was the first to surprise Magnus. Now he's the one in the think tank. There is no combative play, no tension between pieces just yet. Yeah. We're going to have a lot of fun from the start. We were discussing whether this will be a KG start, a more solid approach. But it's clear that Wesley wants to start with, with energy in a combative manner, in an unexpected opening approach here. David, what's the best strategy when you're taken by surprise early on? Perhaps Magnus was considering that B3 would be an option, but maybe not taking it that seriously. How do you approach that situation on the board? Yeah, it feels like there's always two different paths you can take when you're surprised. One, you think, okay, I'm being surprised here. I want to kind of rise to the challenge, fight fire with fire. I'm going to punish my opponent for their uh, temerity in playing such an opening. Or you just think, I want to survive. I want to kind of uh, negotiate the opening, navigate that safely, just get a solid position. As long as I've weathered the initial storm, uh, I will be able to fight on level terms a bit later. And Robert, what do you think? Is this Magnus taking fire by fire or just uh, saying, you know what? You got the first surprise in. I'm playing to equalize here. He's played some feeler moves thus far, but I did see him roll up his sleeves, and so he looks locked in and ready to fight for the center. From the black side, you can always push the C-pawn up two squares. In fact, by playing B6 early on, not only are you welcoming a Fianchetto light square bishop, but you can fight for the center in this manner using your C-pawn to combat a D-pawn. And what, Magnus, he delays that choice. He castles kingside. Both players are playing normal moves at this stage. I would say now that the opening surprise is past us and past them, it's about who's about to come up with a plan. Yeah, both sides are super flexible right now. Wesley can push a bunch of different pawns. Most likely the White King is going to copy and castle on the king side within the ne next few turns. But whether White fianchettos his light squared bishop as well is the first question. Uh, Wesley now mulling those questions over. If white does Fianchetto, then we'll see all four bishops on the longest possible diagonals, all kind of neutralizing each other. And uh, roughly level play there. White's kind of pride and joy right now is the pawn center. White has extra space in the middle. So Wesley will be trying to figure out to ensure, a way to ensure that uh, is maintained over the next few moves. But he's peering into the future. He's trying to work out a plan of action the next half dozen moves or so. And uh, this is kind of a good moment to pause because we ha are reaching the end of the opening. The surprise is over, as Robert says, and um, it will soon be about those middle game plans. Well, you we might see copycat chess when it comes to the bishops. The center definitely is, uh, just for now, advantage Wesley with space. But that means for Magnus, it's going to be about getting a break in the center. And once you're finished with the development, you want to strike with either the C pawn moving forward, and that would be my choice of break in these kind of setups, to eventually force Wesley to decide what he wants to do with those pawns. It's always nice to control the center, but when somebody establishes their pawns on the fourth rank like this, you can challenge them with one simple pawn move. We're talking about the C5 pawn push. If Wesley ever decides to push pawns even further, that's closer to Black's clamp, easier to chisel, uh, camp, I should say, easier to chisel at that center. And so for um, Wesley, he's deciding how to continue his development here I would be feeling kettling, but I'm wondering if Wesley's looking at this position, saying we're on neutral ground, both of us out of whatever semblance of preparation we could have had. It's like, I don't love my position because I don't know what to do next. It's actually coming up with a plan, not just individual moves. Yeah, and Wesley, for a while, he had his head in hands. I was wondering whether he was napping, uh, catching up with uh, some much-needed sleep there. But it feels like he's just indecisive. Feels like he's frozen somewhat. This is a lot of time to invest at this early stage. We're still only on move five, as we see with the move counter on the top left hand of your screens. And he's looking away from the board. He's uh, just mulling over. It's a stylistic choice. He knows he's got basically two options of setting up his pieces, especially when it comes to developing his light squared bishop. And yeah. at some point, he just needs to choose. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just what he's in the mood for. Ultimately, these minutes that he's spending will be much needed later on in the game. Are we getting shades of that Caruana-Carlson game where Fabiano 
spent way too much time in that game four of set one. Of course, this position is a lot different than that game, but uh, right now, Wesley could play a number of moves quite quickly. I just wouldn't advise getting in time trouble against Magnus Carlsen, especially when you're both in this territory where you're unfamiliar uh, with the starting position here. I think that Wesley shouldn't be worried. There's no, he's done nothing wrong, but he's spending a lot of time, and we've seen Wesley be shaky, even by his own words, even what Nordirbeck was saying, in time trouble. So for Magnus, he should be feeling good. He's looking confident sitting across from Wesley right now. More than a three-minute thing by Wesley. So at this early, early stage of the game and the two choices that David was referring to, either moves the king pawn forward or decides to develop the bishop on the g2 square. He goes for the latter, the fiancatoing, and we see the bishops facing each other. What kind of middle games does this uh, opening setup get into? Does this mean that White eventually wants to try to get more space in the centre, perhaps pushing the e-pawn not one step, but two steps forward if allowed? Yeah, I think he would love that, Wesley, so if allowed. But uh, he is slightly behind in development here because Black has already castled. White's next move pretty much is guaranteed to be uh, getting the White King to safety, castling himself. And uh, Magnus will therefore have a move, maybe even two moves, uh, to challenge the, black, uh, challenge the White center. And here we go. He gets ready to do so. Uh, he first pushes this pawn so that uh, he can next, I think, Robert, your move potentially, push the Black C pawn and prevent White from stepping forward, gaining even more space, but no, Magnus staying very flexible here. Uh, putting a knight on the rim, it doesn't look like a great square, but later it might hop back towards the center. He's just getting the pieces out. And uh, this is the downside, the double-edged sword of being creative, freestyling in the opening for Wesley. So yes, you've got a healthy position, a playable position, but it's cost you a lot of time. Probably it's gonna cost you a lot more time because still so many options on every single move. And Magnus being non-committal is actually a good approach at this stage because Black can choose which pawn to push, either the C pawn to challenge the D4 pawn or his D pawn, go up to D5 to challenge the C4 pawn. He has options here, and Knight A6 keeps both of those options alive, as the Knight A6 actually helps in the event that you want to play C5 instead of recapturing with the pawn, you recapture with the Knight, gaining control of that key E4 square. So White cannot push any more pawns in the center of the board at this stage. Black is ready to do that, so Wesley has to think, which direction is Magnus going to go down? Magnus has not made his intentions clear. He hasn't, but it has to be around these central breaks that we're talking about. And it might not even be a choice. We might see both these pawns moving forward eventually with maximum tension in the center, uh, visualizing opening ideas with the pawns moving forward, the queen side stepping to e7, the black rooks coming to the center of the board. You get c5, d5 in. And that feels like the ideal opening development that you want with black. What about the white pieces? Where do you want to place them in the structure? And this is the issue. This is why Wesley's burning even more time on the clock right now he would love to, for example, put his knight on c3. If he gets more time with white, he would love to put his rook across to e1 and throw another pawn into the middle. But the problem in uh, this type of position, as is well known in these types of what we call Queen's Indian structures, where black Fianchetto is on the queen side, black often just plonks a knight onto this e4 square and trades off. Black was slightly cramped due to white having a big pawn center here. So any trade of minor pieces tends to free up black's position. Of course, this isn't the only approach. Uh, Black's knight doesn't have to jump in. Black could go for one of those pawn breaks we mentioned. But uh, this is what forced Wesley to think twice before bringing his knight out. He was scared of a trade of knights opening up this dark square bishop. So instead, he simply pushes a pawn forward. This is really timid play, uh, really kind of non-committal play by either side. I think they're both waiting for Magnus to kind of strike out in the center, and he does. Now we will see what happens with these central pawns. Likely another one incoming soon. Even more so than these pawn breaks in the center, I'm looking at the clock. Magnus has built a nearly four minute lead on time. And if you're Wesley here, he takes in the center. So a little bit has been clarified. I'm wondering if you're keeping one eye on the clock to make sure that you don't get yourself into too much time trouble. Magnus has not recaptured yet. You think that when someone captures your piece, you just take back. But look at how many pieces he can capture back. He will not be taking back with the queen. That would be a blunder. We typically do not want to lead with the queen when so many pieces are on the board, but he can capture, say, with the pawn. That would be the most uh, normal looking move, and he does just that, but he was thinking perhaps I take with the bishop to keep the diagonal open. Yeah, he takes with the pawn, establishing a long-term presence there. Now, space is pretty much level. Um, the pawn structure slightly imbalanced. White has an extra pawn on the E file. Black has an extra pawn on the C file. Black controls the pawn breaks, and it's just about whether Magnus kind of takes a slower maneuvering approach right now, or whether he lashes out and puts another pawn in the center. Black can put a pawn on c5, challenge in the middle, and we'll see maximum tension. It depends on Magnus's mood. 
He's uh, kind of mixing and matching the plans. Uh, this is one you mentioned earlier, Tanya, just bringing the Black Rooks to the centre. It looks very healthy for Magnus Carlsen right now, but still uh, in the balance. And another plan that comes to play after this trade of pawns in the centre is the fight for the E4 square now. Uh, Magnus can line up on the E line, get that rook going and even jump in with that knight to E4. Meanwhile, Wesley looking for counterplay on the C line, trying to target that the C7 pawn. I am expecting the C7 pawn eventually to rise up two squares and once again challenge that D4 centre that we've been talking about. But looking at the clock situation, it feels that Though Wesley managed to get that one B3 early surprise in, Magnus is the one uh, who's happier with the opening outcome. Magnus has easy moves to make, uh, but I just want to note that when black does eventually play C5, it gives white an option to take on C5, either leaving black with an isolated pawn. So let's just show that, right? You can take on C5, and if black takes the knight, hopping the knight towards the center, you have this isolated queen pawn, and Wesley just won a game from the white side of this type of position against Nodirbek Abdusatarov to eliminate the young Uzbek talent. And if he takes with a pawn on C5, we get what's called hanging pawn structure. And I think this is good for Magnus, considering the clock, but what happens in these hanging pawn structures, it's difficult to move either pawn, because if you push a pawn, you leave a square behind. And let's say you push the C pawn, then white says, give me that D4 square. And I'm ignoring the fact that it's giving away a pawn right now. The main principles of those pawns are very difficult to push because it's such a big decision handing key squares away to your opponent. Yeah, often uh, there's kind of a really split camp here. Players either love those hanging pawns or they hate them. And uh, I think Magnus, knowing him a bit, he quite likes these hanging pawn structures, but is a lot of responsibility uh, having these pawns here. They will come under heavy fire in the next few moves, so you need to be ready. And uh, Wesley, again, non-committal with his moves. Rook to E1 looks really, really slow, I've got to admit. Uh, maybe he'll lift the rook up and swing it across uh, to either C2 or D2. But um, either way, Magnus, he's going for those hanging pawns. He's taking the resp re responsibility on, and he's got extra time on the clock to do so. Um, looks like Wesley less familiar, less comfortable in these positions than his opponent. Yes, after that first initial move and surprise, it feels that Wesley's play, pay, play, pay, play, play has been uh, very solid, cagey in this position. But when you don't take the fight to Magnus, Magnus will bring the fight to you. And that's what we're seeing happen in the center right now. He's put the rook on d8, lining up with white's queen, so feels that he's ready with the pieces. The rook from e8 will slide down to c8. I think the big question will come right now for Wesley. Is he going to be the one who takes on, D on C5 with his D4 pawn? Or does he just simply keep the tension on the board as is? Because one thing that Magnus would not like to do here is capture the D4 pawn himself, allowing White's knight to jump to a key D4 square and then be really ideally placed to start targeting the isolated queen's pawn. If I'm Wesley, I am capturing that pawn on c5, but he's now down under six minutes. The time difference is growing between them, but capturing on c5 and then moving that knight on c3 back to e2, take one step backwards just to take two forwards. You're going to leap into uh, the position here because when the knight reroutes to f4, just like in that game against Nodirbek yesterday, you are putting a lot of pressure on the black center. The bishop on b2 is a much happier piece. Uh, White's pieces are coordinated quite nicely. So for Wesley, I would be taking that pawn on c5, but I would also be moving more quickly. And he does not take. He instead leaps his knight forward to b5. He's taking advantage of a square that black can't easily kick that knight out of. Yeah, he's gained a square, Wesley, so this white knight looks pretty strong, but he's also given up this square. It's something you mentioned, you alluded to earlier, Tanya. Black's knight on e4 often is a very strong piece. Anchored by a pawn, nicely supported there. It blocks out this light squared bishop long term, and Magnus instantly seizes this opportunity. Suddenly, he's opened his own bishop, uh, with all the four bishops kind of staring off at each other along these diagonals. It's all about whose bishops are better and who holds the key to the center. Suddenly, black's bishop potentially the stronger of the, uh, of the pair here. And queen to e2, the evaluation bus slides down slightly. It's all about the clock time, so Magnus has literally double the amount of time. And uh, yes, no obvious moves. Suddenly, it's getting a bit sharper, but oh, I'm stunned to like black's position. Move 15, Magnus twice the amount of time on his clock right now, and the one with more control over the center, especially with that last night jump that we saw. It is undoubtedly pressure Wesley right now. He does make the move queen e2, but not easy to find follow-up plans right now. That queen does defend that bishop in b2, which was pinned, 
just to move a goal. You couldn't capture on C5. So perhaps Wesley looking for ways to uh, simplify in the center. And we can expect that pawn takes pawn trade coming up next after Queen E2. And one thing I really like about Wesley's knight jump is he's eyeing that A7 pawn. It looks completely irrelevant, but Black, since the beginning, is want to connect the rooks, put them on the D and C files. That rook on A8 is stuck protecting that pawn on A7. So perhaps a clever try from Wesley. I didn't understand it at first, but now that he's protected his bishop on B2, D takes C5 does feel more annoying for Black. Uh, that Bishop on the dark squares in front of the black king. It's an important defender in the event of a potential attack. Whereas that bishop on b2, it's happy to trade off the board here. So I do think that Magnus has a big question in front of him. And very often when you're playing and every move doesn't have to be one where you make these big decisions. David, you ask yourself, which pieces can you actually improve? The one piece, as you mentioned, the rook from a8 cannot move because a7 is hanging. But that knight on a6, it's done its job. It managed to get c5 in. Is it time to reroute it, try and find a way closer to the Santa? Yeah, there's a few squares for this knight to jump to. If we look at all of the black pieces, as you say, Tanya, when there's no concrete action, when there's no kind of calculation, no attacks, no defense, no threats, why not improve your worst place piece? And black has two of them, this rook doing nothing. Uh, just to point out Robert's uh, idea here, unfortunately, this pawn would simply fall. You lose a pawn for free. Uh, so yeah, it looks like the remaining candidate to be improved is this knight. A few options. You can drop it back, try to trade off for white's knight, but somehow this feels a bit clumsy after a trade. You do get stuck on this open, uh, what's about to become an open file on the C file, stared down by the white rook. Feels a bit counterintuitive. And uh, the question is, do you go the other way? Do you jump forward with the Black Knight? The question now persists, what to do with it next? Do you drop back again towards the center? This looks like maybe the most harmonious move to me. And uh, evaluation bar doesn't react. That's very good. <laughs> Putting pressure on white center, but it does take a bit of time. And maybe Magnus is just wondering what to do here. For example, if the dark squared bishops disappear, are these pawn strengths? Are they weaknesses? Can Wesley chip away at them? I'm not sure exactly how the game would continue. The queen could give a check, for example. The black king may be forced back, and it looks relatively level to me, but maybe Magnus is looking for something even more ambitious. Um, I think his default setting, though, should be improve a piece, uh, because that would be very logical right now. When I was growing up, my coach told me that a good way to try to find your next move is ask yourself three questions. It's the rule of three questions. What's your opponent's threat? If there's a threat immediately, you counter that, you defend against it, you play against it. If there's no threat on the board, ask yourself, what's your opponent's weakness? In this position, there are no big weaknesses right now. The play is still going on. And finally, you ask yourself, what is your worst place piece? So if none of the two apply in the beginning, you go for your worst place, you improve the position. Uh, and I think this, uh, this rule has also been mentioned in, by Jakob Agard, if I'm not wrong. It's a good checklist to keep in mind because uh, some players think when I can capture, I have to capture. That's not the case here. I, capturing on d4, as we've been talking about, that will only help white. Black will be saddled with an isolated pawn. Some trades will happen, and that's good for the side who's playing against the IQP. So knight b4 looks like a very nice move, but perhaps Magnus doesn't like the resulting trades that we saw with a3 kicking that knight back to c6. Uh, so for Magnus, who's had a big time adva advantage, he's using his time wisely, but suddenly it's getting closer on the clock, and that's good news for Wesley So. Yeah, really long think now, over four minutes from Magnus Carlsen. Tanya, early, earlier you mentioned the, okay, your move on the board, nice one. Uh, you mentioned the play, the pay. Look at the pay differential between first and second. Whoa. Ooh. Whoa. That we'll was not that part later. of the plan. <laughs> Night A2. Wow. That is an intruder. <laughs> I've seen Yasser Sarawan games like this where he's talked about funny knight moves, but that knight just trapped itself over here. And in fact, the rook can slide over and the knight cannot escape. The c3 square is covered by both the bishop on b2 and the knight on b5. But what Magnus is doing is saying, go for that knight. I'm going to go for yours in return. And after the move a6, you take on a2, I take on b5. This is looking very interesting, but in a way that white can maybe steal a pawn here, but the queen could get in some trouble. So this is one of these situations where calculation over everything. James Candy, I see you. That's required because bishop a6 at the end of the line, and that white queen is in danger. Yeah. Is she trapped? That's the big question. If she takes a pawn right now, she gets kicked around, and I think she might be caught. I'm trying to just find the killer blow. She's only got one more safe square. How do you close the net around her? Do you f we'll keep chasing her around the board? Is she finally caught in the center? 
what recognition from Magnus to see wow. this from a distance. Right? He didn't just uh, stumble into a pawn sacrifice that hopefully works. That's why he was spending all that time here. That queen is trapped, and that's not a usual place for a queen to get trapped right in the center of the board. And that's not a usual place for the black knight to land on the edge of the board in your opponent territory. Knight to a2, just completely out of the blue. But to play this move, it's one of those do not try this at home moves. If you play this, you need to calculate this line till the very end. And Magnus has gone for the move a6 and Wesley now slows down. If he wasn't to capture that pawn on b5, let's say you take rook takes knight because there is no other move. You have to capture black's knight. White's knight's got no square to retreat. Black takes it back. If you don't go for this line with queen takes pawn, I'm liking black spawn structure now. A pawn from the side has moved towards the center of the board. The A file has opened up. This is advantage Magnus. Big advantage Magnus, especially if he's able to get one more move and push a pawn further down the board, establish a protected pass pawn. But okay, Wesley does find an alternative. He realizes that yes, the black knight is trapped. Yes, the white knight is also trapped, but he can first trade off and make sure that these bishops stare down at each other. Maybe he intends to actually capture this knight with his queen uh, indirectly within the next few moves. This one is really heating up, Robert. But I have to say, that knight a2 idea is brilliant. Chess.com's game review, it gives brilliant symbols when you make a move that's a sacrifice. It wasn't initially a sacrifice, but the idea is so sublime. It just is such a crazy decision to give away your knight, but to get your opponent's knight in return like this. You could tell it caught Wesley so off guard. So love that decision, knight a2. One of those moves that puzzles everybody, including myself, but then when you see the brilliance revealed, Magnus Carlsen coming up with creative ideas, and now he should take back uh, this knight. He'll take back the pawn on c5 in a couple moves, and I, I do like his pawn structure here from the black side. Yeah, maybe he has to be careful here, Magnus Carlsen. If he takes this knight first, I'm wondering whether white... Th oh, no, maybe you don't get time to throw in a sneaky attack on the bishop because the knight drops back and saves itself. But uh, yeah, the pawn structure you mentioned, the brilliant pawn structure, would be this one for black. And uh, if you can keep them alive, this is a really tremendous... Uh, trio. So uh, we're expecting this from Magnus Carlsen. Clocks leveling out or getting closer towards each other. What a game. This has really sprung to life just in the space of the last three moves. Absolutely. Knight A2 is one of those moments where you get a peek into the minds of a genius. This entire idea and the follow-up, we were thinking about how you can improve the position of that knight at the edge of the board. And Magnus just finds a way that I think no one saw coming, including Wesley. So, But Wesley, things are still level. He finds a way to keep the balance going, takes the pawn. Now the bishops will get traded off. And this is one of Wesley's quality as well. He could be taken very well by shock, by surprise with knight a2, but he just composes himself so quickly and finds the best way forward. He's quite an objective player. You don't really see Wesley take unnecessary risks. So if he can trade off all the pieces and secure a position where he doesn't have big losing chances, he will go for that. And right now, he has grabbed that knight on a2. Like David said, the queen takes it and plays b4. So it's kind of like hanging pawns, but there are three of them. But he is gaining access to the d4 score. If black pushes the pawn up to c4 right now, the knight will slide into this juicy d4 square. That bishop on b7, it's a passive piece. Black does have this well-established protected pass pawn on c4. That's the good news. Uh, but that bishop is not great. There are going to be some long-term chances for both sides. It's a very double-edged position. Yeah, really strong move there from Wesley So, and it's not a pawn sacrifice we should mention. Uh, pawn takes pawn. It looks like the white uh, queen uh, is in a bit of trouble here. The pawn in front of her is pinned, but simply a slide to the right, a check, and next move, you regain the pawn. And actually, this is a far inferior version for Magnus Carlsen here. For example, if he moves his king, suddenly pawn takes pawn. The white knight gets access, but you don't have that strong pawn, uh, that pass pawn that Robert was mentioning. So I think Magnus has to pretty much install it now on the c4 square, has to part with that dark square control, but um, yeah, very much kind of dynamically balanced right now. And this is a critical moment. We often talk about critical moments in chess, which are based on calculation long lines, but even trades, structural changes, these are moments that define the rest of the game. So Magnus has slowed down. He needs to take a decision. Does he go forward with the pawn? Does he keep the tension? The line that you were pointing out with that C pawn moving forward, it not only gives Magnus in compensation for that d4 juicy outpost, the, the past pawn, as you mentioned, but also this a3 pawn. That's going to be a long-term weakness in Wesley's camp. Double up the rooks at the edge of the board, the a-line, and you've got to tie down all of Wesley's sources defending that. 
But Magnus takes a thing. C4, is, are there any other ideas that he's considering right now apart from uh, the C pawn moving forward? Well, Magnus is down on time for the first time all game. So that's bad news if you're a Magnus Carlsen fan. Wesley maybe caught him by surprise. It was a clever try with this knight a2, uh, getting your own knight trapped. But this d4 square looking so available to the white knight. I agree with David completely that you should push this pawn to c4. You want to close more lanes. If you take on b4, you're saddled with two separate isolated pawns. That's unideal. But Magnus down under two and a half minutes right now. He could get in danger because he may not have the time to calculate afterwards and he reaches out and he's making a move did he take on b4 yeah that did look like a capture we see that happen queen gives a check a trade offered anytime magnus carlson offers a queen trade you've got to slow down and make up your mind it's always a difficult decision wow this is really anti-positional what magnus is doing it's not what he wants to be doing but he's trying to clarify the matter as uh, tanya says if it comes down to an end game he's banking on the fact that the black knight in the center is so active black's rooks will be relatively active deficiencies in his pawn structure. Yes, Black's bishop is a really poor piece in these ensuing endgames, but uh, he's posing questions to Wesley. Does Wesley keep the queens on? He can avoid the queen trade, go recapture uh, the b4 pawn with his own queen. But uh, big, big decision ahead right now for Wesley. Endgame or no endgame. Uh, tension, no tension. And if the queens do stay on the board, that means that white will be left with this bad A3 pawn. Tanya had highlighted that before. It's a target for Black's pieces. So uh, this was a smart play by Magnus. If he wants to shut down uh, Wesley So's winning chances, queens off the board would have done the trick. But Wesley said, let's keep this game going. Now your pawn on B5 is right in front of the white queen. Can that be grabbed? Whew! D4. Ooh. So Magnus is still throwing shots at Wesley So. That's a big shot. You said endgame or no endgame. Usually when you're playing Magnus, the default answer should be no endgame. Wesley keeps the tension going. Magnus sacrificing to open up that bishop on b7, making it a sniper. Magnus looks away. Are there tactics in this position? I think Magnus... In his mind, he's blundered. He's just thrown away a pawn for pretty much nothing. He's banking, I think he was at least relying on tension, uh, some threats against the F2 square. White's pawn there on F2 near the White King is a bit vulnerable. The Black Queen, X-ray vision, the Black Knight attacking it, but there's no tricks, there's no traps. He's simply given away a pawn and watch out, your B5 pawn is hanging as well. The evaluation bar says he's fine, but Magnus frustrated at himself. He, uh, after regaining uh, composure there, drops his knight back to D6. Wesley's a pawn up. Wesley has some big chances in this game. And maybe he was looking at some kind of knight takes pawn on g3 because the bishop on b7 stares at the knight on f3. That knight is currently under attack. But tactically, that would not have worked out that sacrifice because f takes g3 and the f5 would have been open. Perhaps we can show that later. But knight d6, that is still a good move. You see the evaluation bar, which the players don't have, saying it's maybe marginally better for white. And the reason why is that the extra pawn is now this isolated deep pawn. So black had it. Now it's white's turn. And so white's pawns are a bit vulnerable. The black rook can step up to a4 to put pressure on the queen and that central pawn. Magnus is still doing okay. He's doing okay, but he doesn't have the eval bar telling him that. And we saw him react right after giving up his pawn. Uh, right now, Magnus is on the defense, down a pawn. He is playing for activity of the pieces. The rook hitting the queen, expecting the light squared bishops to be traded off. And just looking at the two rooks eyeing the d4 pawn, that black knight nicely placed, controlling the b5 pawn. I think Magnus has enough to keep things under control in this one. He should have enough, but it is certainly Magnus Carlsen as black on the defensive who needs to show accuracy to draw this game. I don't think right now Magnus has any winning uh, kind of ambitions in his mind. He just wants to save this one because he is down a pawn. Yes, he might win it back. Yes, Black's Rook is active. Black's Knight is actually perfectly placed, as you mentioned, but uh, some work to be done. Bishop's off the board now. And how will Black continue the pressure? Will the Rooks align? Mm. Uh, will black go for those two weak white pawns isolated pawn on the a file and on the d file should be enough to hold but uh it's gonna get hairy as both players approach the one minute mark and he jumps in with his knight magnus really trying to force the issue he's just trying to hoover as i would say everything off the board vacuum everything off the board uh second pawn drops though oh but look at oh. this that black rook is in the sight of the white queen but if you take that rook the knight jumps out of the way into e3 with check to scoop up that queen. So that was really nice tactical awareness from Magnus Carlsen. He's just trying to liquidate at this stage. He's not really playing for a win, but the White King doesn't have too many pieces in front of it. So Wesley, who has been the driver's seat these last few moves, he does still need to exercise some caution. Really nice trick there. Poisoned Rook right now. Wesley cannot take that Rook. He drops back with his Knight, though. 
trying to break the coordination between the Black Rooks. They're kind of protecting each other. I've said it before, X-ray vision. Uh, but one of them is hit now. That white, uh, white knight attacking the Rook in the center. This is where things could fall apart. If Magnus isn't careful, he's now down under one minute. Uh, then his position could collapse instantly, but he's got to be careful now He drops a rook back to hit the white queen really accurate move there to hold things together And it was a very critical one because uh, there was no way to maintain connection of that other rook on the fourth rank uh, To indirectly defend the a4 rook so rook a5 hits the queen not giving Wesley time to capture the rook on d4 But it feels like so many pieces are codependent right now defending each other and Magnus still needs to be careful because that queen can stay connected to that black knight on the board, creating threats. Wesley needs to be careful because he's down to 20 seconds. This is not an easy position to figure out. I think if Wesley's given the opportunity, he'll try to trade those queens. Knight d2, hitting the queen on b3, forcing a knight trade here. And I think if all these pieces come off, Wesley with an a3 pawn, he still has maybe an outside shot to win the game. But Magnus, you know him. He knows end games like the back of his hand. He'll be able to hold that. And you can do that right now, right? You trade everything off on F3, give a check on D3, and I was going to say, you win the A3 pawn. And then I just realized there's another rook on E1. You have to step up on the third rank at the end of all the trades. And actually, Wesley survives with the A3 pawn. Wesley will be a pawn up. It's not the best pawn in the world, the white A3 pawn. Probably more of a weakness than a strength right now. But as uh, you mentioned there, Tanya, if you don't win it, if the queens come off, rooks come off, suddenly that pawn could be priceless. So Wesley re captures the knight right now, it's still level material. How does Magnus try to compensate for the pawn? The longer you're just a pawn down in this end game, the more afraid you become. So uh, will he keep the queens on? Magnus loves so. his end games, but he can block uh, this trade of queens by swinging black's rook over. No, he goes for the pure end game. And okay, it's only Wesley, Wesley who can win now. It's a two result game. Magnus needs to show great defense to hold this game. I love that move, though. By pushing his pawn, he wanted to push it one step further, and he's trying to kick the king back and also gain some key squares for his rook. So Wesley's king, that's going to be stuck over there on g2 or on that side of the board. And then how do you push your pawn? You'll need to line up both of the white rooks to the uh, square, but after rook d3, rook e3 is forced. And now without these rooks on the board, white's pawn structure, it's fractured, which makes it harder and harder to win. Yeah, if the white king was slightly quicker, if the white king gained a few moves, rushed over to the queen side, kicked away the black rook as a blockader, white's a pawn would run down the board, sprint down the board and win the game, promote. Uh, but I don't think he's going to be quick enough. Look at Magnus's king now incoming. White's pawn structure just too weak on the other flank. Uh, I think Magnus has estimated this one correctly. Wesley waits. A bit of an odd one there with his rook. And uh, I think we'll see. He has to be quick, though, David. Ooh, a decision there from Wesley. I think Wesley's a bit nervous that if his king goes to the queen's head, pawn h4 for black could be a thorn in his side. And Magnus plays it anyway. But if that king were closer to the queen side, after rook takes h4 here, that h3 pawn would have been tender. But now the king comes to its defense. But Wesley <laughs> does seem uncertain. He's bringing his king to two squares without letting go. I think we're going to see a repetition right here, and it is being played out. And the first game of the first set of the championship fight ends in a draw. Wesley So gets in a 1b3. Magnus with some incredible middle game play. Jumping with that move with the knight. Knight a2. What a move that was. And eventually giving up a pawn, falling in a bit of trouble. Magnus under pressure, navigates his way through the tactics eventually. And a peaceful result, but not without moments of high tension. It's one of these games, and you hear the arbiter talking to the players about when the next game will be. <laughs> Magnus says, yeah, okay, that sounds good to me. But it's one of those games where both players have reason to be happy and reasons to be unhappy. For, for Magnus, he had this clever night jump, uh, but then he... Blundered, sacrificed a pawn. It worked out, so maybe it was a sacrifice. But for Wesley, once hit with that surprise, he handled things to perfection. Mm. He was never in any true danger. So both players, it was a mixed bag. Yeah. It was uh, quite the tension on the board in those moments, David, after D4, after Knight A2. And even though it started slow as a KG fight, things built up. Things definitely built up. They build up to a head later on. And it was when Magnus sacrificed a pawn that perhaps Wesley So started to get a bit excited. It was here Magnus threw a pawn away, threw it off the board. He played pawn to d4. Actually a very good practical move before white is allowed to establish a bind by putting something on the d4 square and blocking up black's bishop forever. So throwing this pawn off the board, we suddenly saw a reaction from Magnus Carlsen, perhaps missing, as Robert mentioned earlier, that knight takes pawn here is not possible. 
Yes, you unleash an attack against this white knight, but after the very sneaky capture away from the center, so you find your bishop pinned at the end of the variation. Black here would be doomed, the bishop or the queen would fall, you lose material. So Magnus suddenly had to recompose himself. He very wisely dropped back his knight to the d6 square, putting pressure as well on this white knight. And a few moves down the line, we saw another very nice tactic from Magnus Carlsen in this position. He is down two pawns, but he found a nice rejoinder to save the game. Rook takes on d4, defending this rook indirectly because if it's captured, this knight check out of the way, hitting the white king, gaining time, would have won the white queen. There were some uh, interesting moments later on in the endgame, but ultimately Magnus Carlsen was never in too much trouble. And Wesley So continues to be that B3 cowboy. And we see a tweet from earlier for Wesley. He said, it's now or never Magnus responding to what's not to like. It's not a terrible move, says Magnus, about the prospect of fulfilling his 2023 resolution to win a tour game with one B3. Is it now or never for Magnus? He gets the white pieces in game two. Will we expect B3? Ooh. That's going to be quite the troll if Magnus responds and returns the favor with the 1b3. We will find out and of course the action is all happening in Toronto. The epic, epic finals that we are watching. It's all eyes uh, on Toronto and there's a party on. Everyone is celebrating this big clash in Toronto. It is happening. The watch party with chess players, with chess fans from the city and we will be back with Game 2 action. And uh, what's your thoughts on uh, Wesley So? Hyper solid player, <laughs> you know. A very solid player. Wesley is solid. <laughs> I think that if he had more uh, maybe self confidence or belief in himself then he could have even achieved more than he did but what he achieved in his career so far has already been quite enormous and I've always found him one of the most difficult players to get to, even in advantage against. If he can regain some of the form that he had last year and the global championship here in Toronto then, then he has a chance. Wesley is a formidable opponent, very rarely loses, always ready to pounce uh, when you make a mistake but otherwise it's also very difficult to beat him, so that's a, a great combo. And when he feels the blood, he's, uh, he's always there. Normally I would say that uh, the match format is very well suited to, to his style, but it feels that he's been, he's been considerably less solid maybe in the last year and a half. Doesn't really look for <laughs> winning sometimes, but he really hates losing, so it's really difficult to beat him. He's a very good person, his character is really good, so um, I have a lot of respect for him. A new opening for your wall is here. Capture new major pieces on unique metal posters from Displate. Now with the official collection from Chess.com. Mount them in seconds with a tool-free magnet kit and swap them whenever you like. Make your move. Get an exclusive discount on all metal posters. Shop now with the code CHESS at Displate.com. Here in Toronto for the Tour Finals with the reigning champion, Magnus Carlsen. So with this field, with uh, the format that we have here, uh, what do you think is in store for the fans who will watch this? Uh, I'm sure there will be plenty of um, exciting matches. Maybe I have a couple of exciting matches and the rest are pretty swift. <laughs> uh, what would it mean to you to win it again? I think this is the strongest final there's, there's ever been. I think to find anything that would top the um, uh, final of the inaugural season with the seven set match against the car would be, would be tough. Now we do hope we have new fans watching as well. So if we do have that, uh, how would you describe your playing style? Um, uh, I would say I'm fairly, fairly universal. Probably I lean slightly more technical than than tactical, um, depending on the day I can play. I can play in any style. Perfect. My well, Magnus, we wish you best of luck in Toronto. Thank you for joining us. It doesn't look like much, but neither would a Sicilian defense to the untrained eye. This is a performance enhancer. You don't see it. How about now? Manage your air quality, sharpen your performance, change the game with air things.
one of these cities, don't watch the finals alone. You can join one of these watch parties happening in your cities at these very cool chess clubs and enjoy all the action with your chess friends and families. And don't forget to send us some photos while you're there as well. And talking about celebrating chess with everyone, we've got a fan zone in Toronto where a lot of chess is happening. It's chess fever in the city. And we've got James Canty, who's down by the Belfast Love. He's at the pub, he's having fun. Let's check in with James. James, how are you doing? I'm doing great. We're at the Belfast Love at the Fan Zone. Do you hear that? Can y'all hear? Look at this. Look at all the people behind me. You got Aryan Tari standing right there, Eric Hansen. You got Aman. It's fun. It's live. There's boards everywhere. It's nothing like it, Tanya. Back to you. <laughs> James, this sounds like your dream job to me. By the pub, playing chess, having fun with the boys. Tanya, I'm going to stay here, okay? <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not coming back, okay? Oh, well, James, you got to keep us updated with all that happens. I'm going to say, I mean, we're feeling a bit bad. We wish we were there with you right now. Oslo's fun. Of course, you always have, uh, you know, the Good Night Pub out there. Shout out to the buddies out in Oslo. But it's, we have our Toronto version of it, and I'm not going anywhere anytime oh. soon. So you're yeah. going to have to pull me out of here for me to leave. It's a lot of fun, a lot of chess. We're watching the match. So, you know, I know you guys are having a good time over there too, huh, Tanya? And, uh, James, I just wanted to ask, who is everyone cheering for out there in Toronto? Are they cheering for Magnus Carlsen or yes. Wesley So? It's a little bit of both, but I think they're mostly going towards Wesley because he's the soft-spoken, oh, no, Magnus, go easy on me, you know, like, but he's really, really strong. We already know this. He's just trying to play the victim card at the same time. But uh, most people are, are uh, rooting for Wesley here, but they just want to see a good fight at the end of the day, David. Let's what are be, you rooting for, David? Well, James, I'm going to save David here. Let's be honest. But most people in a pub <laughs> are probably rooting for you to chess box against Amon. So when are we getting that to happen? Yeah, well, first, I'm going to show one of these. Of course, we're going to flex one. We always got to do that, of course. And then secondly, a mom was like, yeah, I don't want to do that. I'm going to retire at the top because he already got a dub. He's a world champion boxer already. So he was like, I don't want to do that. We're going to let Canty have it. And I totally respect him for that. All right, James, enjoy yourself. That looks like so much fun. And we'll check in with you. I don't think I'm expecting you back at the playing arena anytime soon. But you have a good day there. Thank you. You do the same. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> James Gandhi at the Fan Zone in Toronto. And he said that the crowd is rooting for Wesley. And I can imagine. I mean, last time Wesley was there, the Chess.com Global Championship, he won the whole thing. He's got fans in Toronto. He's got fans in Toronto. He's got fans all around the globe. And I think that many people root for the underdog. We saw the stats at the start of the show that heading into today's match, Magnus Carlsen, 75% favorite. Wesley had the other 25%. Will this be the one of the four that Wesley needs? Toronto seems to be rooting for him. Yeah, it feels like his city, pretty much his hometown at this point, Wesley. So uh, where he's had so much success before. And if he plays like he did in that first game, putting Magnus Carlsen under some pressure, I'm not betting against him either. It feels like this is going to be the closest of close finals. And all bets are off. The two players in their best form, showing us some world-class chess in Toronto. And Kaya did catch up with Magnus after that Game 1 action. That was Game uh, 1. And, uh, well, Magnus coming to the board here, facing 1v3 in the first game. What was your reaction? Well, I mean, he's played it before. And, I mean, it's partly memeing, I, I guess. But, it's I mean, it's a good move. So, no big deal. Is it something um, that is offensive at all to face? No, of course not. Okay, good. Um, what did you think of the first game here? Um, I was really happy with the opening. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, I like these setups for um, for Black quite a bit. Um, I think he found um, he found a good plan with Knight B5 and Queen E2, but I was also quite happy with my, my reply there. And I was really looking for ways to to fight for an advantage, but I didn't really find them. Um, and then I miscalculated a bit, so I actually had to, to fight for the draw a little bit, but fortunately it was not too difficult. You didn't feel under big pressure at any at any point there? No, by no means. Maybe there was objectively pressure, but I didn't feel it. What can we expect from game two when you have the white pieces? 
I don't know yet, um, but um, I mean, I'll try and win, of course. Sounds good. Thank you, Magnus. Magnus Carlsen, he's going to try to win game two. Back to you guys. There's no game that Magnus Carlsen doesn't try to win. He was a bit disappointed that he couldn't find a way to create more chances with Black, which sees the score level. This is game one, set one, and we're just getting started. And from the action that we saw in game one, starting from the early opening surprise to Magnus's approach to counter it, we're in for a big fight. We certainly are. And in the semifinals, Magnus Carlsen could not get through Fabiano Caruana without going through Armageddon. Wesley So, he made it through Armageddon against Norebeka Buzitarov. Little is separating these players at the top. Yeah, feels like just one or two moves might decide this final. Uh, whether that's today, whether that's tomorrow, who knows. But these two, they very rarely blunder. Wesley, I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen him blunder throughout his entire career. And uh, at this point, it feels like it will need something special. Maybe a creative game like we saw in there, kind of head-to-head -head in the round, Robin. It will need so something magical to uh, break the deadlock. Magnus Carlsen starts with the white pieces in the round robin. It did go down to the Armageddon. And when Wesley had the white pieces in game two, he shut off the action very quickly. It was a quick draw out of the opening. He wanted to take the fight to the Armageddon. Do you think that could be part of his strategy? It becomes more random if it reaches sudden death? Wesley definitely wants to get to Armageddon because that means he hasn't lost in the four games to Magnus Carlsen. So Magnus is the favorite. He's the highest rated player in chess history. He gets the white pieces in game two and game four. So two whites in many three games. So Wesley, as he enters the playing hall, he's going to have to be ready with the black pieces to stave off Magnus' pressure. Now the big question is, what will be Magnus's first move of choice to try and create his chances with the white pieces? Wesley might want to keep it solid, but Magnus Carlsen, he is ready for the fight. He's always ready for the fight. And it's handshakes and we're off. And which move will it be? Oh, he reached over to the queen side. I thought it might be b3. No, it's pawn to c4, the English opening. And Wesley so replies instantly. He plants a pawn in the center himself. He puts a black pawn on e5. A knight comes out. Wesley again does the same. All the knights are coming out into the center here. And uh, we'll get those moves on our live board very shortly. Uh, but it is one of the main lines of the English opening. Not too surprising, Robert. And Wesley played the English against Nordirbeck when he needed to beat him. So Wesley plays this from the white side. Most players at the top have to uh, face openings that they enjoy playing from the other color. But after the four knights variation of the English here, Magnus the one sitting and thinking because he can fianchetto his light square bishop by playing the move pawn to g3. He chooses it, as you see on screen here. Or there were other alternatives, but now we are going to see a central clash. And we see trades are happening in the center of the board. No Mimi opening by Magnus, the solid English. And I want to ask you, because we've been seeing this term being dropped around a lot, Mimi openings. Give me some examples. What are these and why are they so Mimi? Mimi openings <laughs> tend to be non-traditional openings or openings we very rarely see at the top level. Often there's a sneaky idea behind them, whether it's the bong cloud with uh, a very incorrect early king move, whether it's, uh, I'm trying to think of other Mimi openings, 1b3, let's say, which uh, doesn't occupy the center. It's something that kind of is a rare guest at top level and often is kind of designed to either troll the opponent, throw off the opponent, maybe some mind games involved. Uh, but this is very correct chess, uh, comparatively. And would they usually be one game opening approach? Something that you don't end up repeating in a match? Unless you're Hikaru and you play <laughs> Mimi openings on every, <laughs> on every single turn, every single game. And uh, yeah, normally there's a time and a place. Uh, we see a lot of Mimi openings online. Uh, mm -hmm. Often players, they have kind of pet lines where they kind of loyally adopt certain openings, even if they know objectively they're not the best because they know all the tricks behind them. Shout out to the Stafford Gambit uh, and Eric Rosen out there. But uh, either way, this is uh, much uh, more traditional stuff. Much more traditional stuff. And we're seeing some traditional plans being played right now. It looks like White, though, has got, again, a more solid approach, a more solid setup, still not breaking out in the center. But very often, these openings do end up sort of exploding in the center. There is action that happens. But right now, it's just very early on. Very early stages between these two players, and we see we do not have a symmetrical pawn structure. Black has traded his D pawn for white C pawn. Black has those knights developed, will get ready to castle. 
White's already castled, but if you look into the position on each player's half, not a single piece is past Magnus Carlsen's third rank, whereas Wesley has two pawns on his fourth rank, the fifth rank of the board. So White has sacrificed a little bit of space for a quick development, and that bishop on g2, that Fian Keto bishop, it slices across the board and may be the strongest piece down the line. I actually play this opening with the black pieces, uh, and I like that Wesley has stopped Magnus's pawn from going all the way to b4. So Magnus has to be happy with just putting it one step ahead to take out that bishop on b2, which then starts targeting Wesley's center pawn. And very often the decision here is if white is able to get that d pawn moving up the board. Do you are you able to strike with d4? It becomes a fight for that square because black's knight often finds itself to stop that break. Yeah, black is perfectly poised to stop the center from opening uh, within the near future, at least. Um, I will just mention before we delve into the specifics of the position, we see the board in front of us, the clocks, we will get to you. Um, both players have an ocean of time right now. Um, they've barely spent that much of their 15 minutes and we'll get those updated. So stay tuned. But uh, yeah, it's all about the center right now. White isn't able to strike. White isn't able to open up. Uh, the bishops take advantage of the uh, development uh, kind of lead here. So it's very much about just putting pieces in position. Bishop on the long diagonal, rook soon on the semi-open file, and black needs to guard against this uh, idea you mentioned, Tanya. Is this just a theme or a coincidence that for the second consecutive game, Magnus is fiend both bishops? Is there something he's eyed in uh, Wesley's history where maybe he's uncomfortable with this dynamic? Or do you feel like it's just what Wesley is playing, so he's reacting? I think a bit of both, Robert. I think Magnus ha does have this kind of uh, affinity for uh, kind of fianchettoing his bishops. He's played it a lot, especially the last couple of years, I've noticed. He loves to just fianchetto at any given opportunity, but Wesley's pretty much asked him to do so, uh, especially the first game. Uh, once Magnus fianchettoed once, it kind of made sense to be logical, uh, consistent, and fianchetto both bishops. And I'm surprised we're seeing Magnus pause. Uh, the logical follow-up to his move would be to plant this bishop on the long diagonal. Then again, he might be slightly tempted now that the black queen's vision towards the d4 square has been cut off uh, by her own bishop. d4 on the cards. Why not explode the center? I'm really surprised by Wesley's choice of square for developing that bishop. Because usually you either put it in front of the king, keeping that D line open for the queen, and we see Magnus take advantage of just that. He gets the moment, the opportunity to strike in the center. Of course, it's nothing drastic, but it is step one of White's plan right now. Because that bishop, when it lands on B2 and when it does, you're looking at an open diagonal now. And this d4 pawn break was perfectly timed. Well, you want to line your queen up with this dark square bishop if we see that series of trades in the center because there could be some checkmating ideas down the line if that knight on f6 is dislodged. So uh, for Wesley, he's playing for a solid position, but now he's ceding ground to the world number one and the c file is open. Rook can just slide on over to c1. That's very natural. That knight on c3 can actually jump forward to the b5 square at any moment to try to get the two bishops advantage. I certainly like Magnus' position thus far, and I feel like Wesley would also prefer to have this from the white side. Definitely. I think uh, just the fact that he opened 1b3 in the previous game, Wesley, uh, this is pretty much a dream position. Magnus didn't play 1b3, but he soon put a pawn on this square, soon fianchettoed his bishop, and it does look really promising. This, this bishop will uh, become open sooner rather than later, as will its counterpart, its uh, fellow bishop, on the other diagonal. So Wesley has to be really careful, and he tries to Ooh. block the center. He tries to plug uh, the middle of the board, but... The white knight attack now can simply slide back. Magnus will drop his knight back, and this pawn will be doomed in the next few turns. Wesley has some concrete ideas in mind there, perhaps, but um, I'm a bit surprised that he played it so quickly, Wesley, so this is really committal stuff. He's probably eyeing that d4 pawn in exchange of that e4 pawn that you're pointing at. White's knight, I don't think you want to go to h4. You'll probably end up getting trapped after a move like g5. Very few squares left. Knight either falls all the way back to e1 between the queen and the rook or to d2. And he does make a decision. Now, this means a pawn trade. Wesley can pick up the d4 pawn. He gives up the e4 pawn. Who does this benefit? I would say that white is going to be happy in most of these positions because we look at each minor piece as we will see some trades initiated in the center. The light square bishop for white is clearly better than the light square bishop from black. And so that is a long-term advantage. And we have a, an asymmetrical pawn structure where black has three pawns on the queen side to white's two. And after the e4 pawn is gobbled up, we'll have four pawns to three for white 
aiming from the E to the H file. So I do think that this position, it's kind of a mixed affair, and I would prefer White's chances because the resulting trades open up the bishops, and Black's bishop on C8, rook on A8, they're not playing their part. Yeah, it uh, will become quite concrete. I'm really surprised Magnus is even he hesitating right now. Thank you uh, to our fantastic producers for getting the clock. That's a nice close-up for both players. Uh, still with a lot of time left. Magnus there with just over 10 minutes. Magnus as white in move right now. And Wesley, he's been playing much, much faster than in the previous game. He's up at just under 13 minutes. Uh, so Magnus, a bit of pressure on the clock there. Uh, dipping below the 10 minute mark very shortly, but he does eventually capture this pawn. We see the live action shot there and things are opening. It's those bishops, those fianchettoed bishops on g2, b2 that uh, will be benefiting from this little transition. But Wesley, I think his idea is to trade off and uh, soon to park the black bishop on e5 to challenge for squares and uh, challenge for this diagonal. White's bishop is a bit loose, so potentially some tactics in the air and he does play that move. Uh, so right now it is getting sharp. The position, the center has exploded and Magnus needs to navigate uh, that little change in scenario. What a weird looking position where the entire <laughs> diagonal from A1 up to G7, if that king slid over to H8, we would have a full diagonal, and but that's not going to happen. But one thing that I would consider if I were Magnus right here is that there's a knight trade on offer. I wouldn't do that. I would actually slide my knight in the other direction, up to C5. The B7 pawn is loose, and maybe I'll reroute that knight back to D3 to kick the black bishop out of the center. So that knight on D4 for black, I do think it's a bit loose there, and so Magnus should look for some tactics. Yeah, that's a really nice variation, Robert. I think quite an important one as well. If black is able to, for example, uh, after a trade, develop the queen, bring this bishop out to a really nice juicy square, counterattack against white's pawn, then things could turn very quickly. Black is active as well. Uh, so right now in the balance, but it is white's move. So uh, pressure on white, uh, kind of luxury for white actually uh, to have this one move to create threats of his own. So Magnus Carlsen needs to be accurate. This knight jump looks really, really nice and productive and uh, multiple ideas hidden there. But look at the clocks. Magnus is down now by almost four minutes. And just like the previous game where we were talking about this narrative, yes, the position's fine. The clock could play a huge factor later on. And uh, this position could still go either way. We're still at the critical stages of the early middle game. Yeah, and also the same storyline of starting with a solid opening, but things getting very tensed very quickly uh, in the center. And we can see all the pieces, they're eyeing each other. There are knight jumps that would open threats. So a really big moment here for Magnus because he needs to just navigate the next few moves. But to me, it looks like with that bishop on g2 and the knight jump that you're pointing at, that there has to be a way for white to be the first to build pressure here. I really like your idea of knight c5, just getting out of any trades on e4, making sure that black queen doesn't land on that f6 square. The bishop eyeing uh, the g4 square, bishop to g4, you fight against that by putting pressure on b7. But Magnus, he's taking his time right now. And Wesley doesn't look particularly bothered by what's happening here. He's well ahead on the clock. He has good centralization of pieces. And we have to calculate certain lines when the knight goes up to c5. And let's say it even does successfully take on b7. Can it get out of there? Sometimes the knight wanders into enemy territory, and it doesn't live long to tell the tale. So for Magnus, is knight c5 a legitimately strong move, putting pressure on a pawn? Or is it just going to be kicked out of that c5 square, and will black be able to stabilize? I still like it, because rerouting to d3 catches my eye, uh, but Magnus, the responsibility is on his shoulders. He can't just make a move, take it back, and look for better. It's really tentative play, though. Hesitant play from Magnus Carlsen. He's now down more than five minutes on the clock, and yeah, no sight of a move yet. I will say this type of position does tend to suit Wesley so style, because yes, there's a bit of calculation, some short, sharp, two, three move uh, lines here and there that you have to work out, but fundamentally, Black's position is very sound. No real weaknesses for Black. No real targets uh, that white can head for. And the more trades that happen, actually, the more that might suit black because white does have these weaknesses long term on the queen side. So uh, Wesley feeling confident unless Magnus can unleash something here and now. And the one thing that perhaps Magnus wants to avoid in this position is giving a bishop pair to black. If you're just, if you make a waiting move here, like a move like h3 or rook c1, a kind of a non-committal move, a non-aggressive move, Wesley does have the idea of himself capturing that central knight and then jumping in with f3, giving a check, picking up that bishop on b2, and none of that really matters right now. 
because Magnus has taken a decision that we were critical of. He does trade the knight on f6. Westy doesn't even pause for queen takes knight. Well, it did matter, I would say, because instead of e3, had white jumped forward with the knight, then exactly what you're saying uh, would have appeared on the board, that any knight move allows a black knight to move out the way, and the bishop on b2 uh, would have been loose. So e3 is played. That way there are none of these funny knight jumps. But knight b5 is still available. Let me challenge your knight to try to get that dark square bishop. So I think that if Wesley finds knight b5 here, anything that could have been worse, that's behind him. And now we're talking a position where he's completely stable. Yeah, looks super tempting right now. A little bit to calculate, I guess, after knight to b5. If that knight is captured, queens might disappear. I think queens are likely to dis disappear on the d file within the next couple of moves. But uh, yeah, ultimately that looks quite safe for black. Uh, maybe the other option would be to just drop back uh, to one of these two squares and say, yes, this tension is uh, a bit odd between the bishops, but black's definitely not having the worst of those. I think it's more about the fact that black needs to accelerate play right now. Otherwise, this bishop will be inferior to its counterpart, white's bishop, uh, bishop putting pressure. Black's simply stuck at home. So that's why I feel uh, we're all quite attracted to this move, knight b5, uh, kind of accelerating the play, forcing the tactics, and uh, they look fine for black. And at some point, as Black, you want to make the move C6 to blunt out that bishop on G2 to make sure that that B7 pawn doesn't remain hanging. Wesley finds the accurate way. He goes knight to B5. The bishop on B2 will be picked up. So he does get that bishop pair going. And uh, once he's able to get C6, what White is relying on is perhaps to get the knight back to D4, making sure that more pieces, more minor pieces get traded off. But to me, that looks like we're, go we're headed towards a second draw. It looks very likely. And Magnus, I think he cursed himself briefly. He is not happy with his standard of play. He's not even looking at the board right now. But what's just occurred is white steals a pawn on c7. Yes, the white rook in the corner is under attack. But if black takes white's rook, white takes black's. I still think this is what Wesley should go down because after bishop takes rook, and we're just going to see this, we don't have to show you it, bishop b2 right now, those queenside pawns are quite vulnerable. So even though white is ahead material at the moment, you have to be really careful. Bishops are long-range pieces, and a bishop coming out to e6 quite quickly. Next, b3 can be in danger. If you're Magnus, perhaps you just uh, acknowledge that this should be a draw, and you make that draw happen before it gets too late. And Magnus low on the clock as well. He can push the A pawn one step ahead and then try and get that knight out to B6. But Magnus, uh, Wesley, sorry, will develop that other bishop to E6 as we were talking about it. Give up the B7 pawn. The bishop's activity is more than compensation in this position. How likely is this to end quickly in a draw? Oof. I don't want to put a number on it, but very high chances, I think, right now. Yes, white has a four versus three majority on the king side, but that is irrelevant. That's uh, kind of the last factor on Magnus's mind right now. He actually drops his knight back, and I think this is pretty much tantamount to a draw offer. If black goes and takes this pawn now, white will be able to take off this black bishop, even maybe go a pawn up again, but we would see opposite color bishops. The rooks might not stay on the board too much longer, and... I think this might be in its final throws this game. And I'll say that the rooks coming off the board is really the essential point because after uh, black grabs this pawn on a3, white takes the bishop, b7 falls. If the rook stayed on the board, we've seen Magnus win many endgames of that nature, but rook c1 at the end of the line forces the draw. Wesley goes for it, and without more pieces, you can't attack, pile up pressure on squares. And you can't put too much pressure once the black king moves, pawn goes to f6. There's no pass pawns. The players are going to find a way in this position to just repeat things and uh, there's no hope to play here. With equal pawns on one side, on the queen side, that extra pawn counts for nothing. And uh, Magnus, he does bring his king forward. You can create one passer, but with the opposite color bishop complexes, that, bishop, that passer will be stopped. So a matter of moves, Magnus down to less than six minutes on the clock. But for me, this feels that like Wesley got out of the opening without too much difficulty with black. Yeah, maybe just one or two small kind of half chances for Magnus to complicate the issue, uh, to be a bit more ambitious. But ultimately, Wesley's new, uh, kind of just found really smooth ways to hold this one. And you can see both players' body language. They're playing so quickly, racing towards the draw now. Ultimately, White will only be able to create one pass pawn. You need two, though, in opposite color bishop endgames. Black will blockade on the dark squares. Black's king can even just park itself on a square such as e7 later to block uh, that advance of the e-pawn and this one, yeah, simply nothing to do. 
And just it's only one pawn. Opposite color bishops always play on to the end, especially if you're pawn up, just in case. And, uh, but at this level, at this elevated level, unfortunately, just a draw. No one won a game by agreeing to a draw, but this one is, uh, regardless of how long it goes on, is headed that direction. Magnus doesn't immediately fall back with the king, implying a repetition. He does move the pawn forward, so he is going to play this one out. Uh, Wesley puts all his pawns in the same colour as his own bishop just to make sure that everything remains defended. Yeah, good strategy in general. And uh, Magnus, he's just going to play around a bit. How soon do you think we'll see the draw, Robert? It should be soon, and I want to you know, give a shout-out to Wesley. He had the black pieces in this game. So many players have struggled against Magnus Carlsen but he's had no difficulty from start to finish. And it's not a position where there are any cheapos or tactics or tricks. Uh, th there's just one extra pawn. It's on e4. And that's why Wesley parked his bishop on d6. In order to push that pawn, the white king would need to step forward to defend the square. But as soon as that bishop leaves f5, the black king can step right back in opposition of the white king. So it just you make sure you control the dark squares. There's nothing that white can do about it. I think it's about to happen now. We're going to see the bishop stuff shuffling around with no way to improve, no way to even really find a way uh, to get that e pawn moving forward. But perhaps if the king was to step in opposition right now, what Magnus wants to do is give a check from the other side, from that e8 square. And then we will see the line that you were pointing out with the e pawn moving forward. Yeah. He will actually be able to force the pawn through, but the problem is, yes, it will be an e-pawn, yes, it's just one pawn, but Black's king will always blockade on the dark square. The black bishop will do a great job of defending the a5 pawn and the h6 pawn. White's king will not be able to attack them both simultaneously. They're both separated. Uh, I think just great strategy from Wesley just to set up everything, all the pawns on dark squares. And we'll see this happen. I think we'll see everything uh, we've been describing unfold. Magnus just playing around, repurposing, remaneuvering his bishop, but ultimately not much progress. I think uh, his final trick will be to give a check and hope that the Black King goes in the wrong direction if there was a, uh, if there was a wrong direction there. <laughs> but uh, now the pawns are traded off. Look at the Black King. That white e-pawn will never be able to bypass on the dark squares. Yeah, any moment now I think we'll see the handshake. Can't kick that king out of e7. That's the nature and there's the handshake. Draw agreed. We're 1-1 in the first set of this title match. And that was uh, an English opening by Magnus, but he got nothing out of it as Wesley with clinical trades goes into an opposite color bishop endgame. A solid, solid hold by the so solid Wesley. Yeah, rock solid. He'll be so pleased with himself as, uh, as well. Often your first black game, there's nerves jangling. Uh, you know your opponent will come for you when they have white, but ultimately he didn't face a single problem at all. He was always in control. And roles reversed in a way where the player with the white pieces was the player that was in some time trouble. So uh, for Magnus Carlsen, you see him stepping out of the playing hall into the hallway in Toronto. He got all of nothing with the white pieces. Credit to Wesley. Stubborn defense. Never gave him a chance. Yeah, very similar to what we saw from Magnus in game one with the black pieces. So we are seeing a cagey fight between these two players, which has left us with a one-to-one and uh, we will be having game three. Two more rapid games. And again, in this format, yes, you can hide, but you can't. You can't survive forever from the decisive result because there will be an Armageddon in case of a 2-2 tie. It's still far away. And to me, it looks like the players are just settling into a match. It is a long match. It is first a best of two set. And if that's a tie, it goes into the third final set. So not rushing their decisions, not playing very provocative chess so far. There's a title on the line. There's a $100,000 prize difference between first and second. If you win this, $200,000 in the bank. So there's so much at stake. And there's little that separates players at the top to begin with. So why give your opponent a victory? No unnecessary risk. Solid approach from both players thus far. And nothing has separated them at all. A really, really even fight, and we haven't really found one player get a big advantage or a dominating position out of the opening. David, the second one, also had a similar narrative to we saw what we saw in game one. What stood out to you? Yeah, very similar narrative, just high-quality chess in general. And chess with best play should objectively be a draw. There was one moment maybe Magnus Carlsen would have been kicking himself that he didn't uh, apply more pressure. Perhaps he could have kept more pieces on the board and asked more questions, but it was here that uh, things pretty much fizzled out towards that peaceful outcome. 
Magnus Carlsen, we were talking about a knight jump. Uh, this tension between knights is really awkward. He could have jumped to c5, applying pressure to this b7 pawn. And if black now reacts and, for example, blocks this long diagonal, then ideas such as dropping the knight back, kicking away this bishop, and the game would continue. It's hard to imagine too big of an advantage here for white, but at least these bishops on long diagonals do give you good long-term prospects. And uh, instead, however, Magnus couldn't stand the tension. He wanted to trade things off. But it was in this position after pawn to e3, Wesley found a really nice way to totally neutralize any prospect of an advantage. Knight back to b5, profiting from this pin. It's actually a pawn sacrifice, as we saw after a few trades. Knight takes pawn on c7 now. But as we saw, everything just disappeared. Takes, takes, takes. And at the very end, after a few more adventures, we saw this dynamic. Opposite color bishops, dead draw. And Magnus Carlsen's not going to be unhappy with the result, but at the top, they just want to apply the pressure, as you were saying. So they kicked themselves. Why couldn't I make Wesley sweat more? There was no sweating in that game. The result was never in doubt. Wesley so played perfectly. He held a draw. He gets white pieces in game three. It is ultimate glory on the line. Championship on the line. $200,000 for the winner. So much... Uh... Uh, so much at stake for these players and the battle between the two best performers starts uh, with a KG fight. And of course, celebrating uh, chess, we also have a really cool posters to decorate your walls. Bring more chess into your life with these displayed posters. They're lightweight, they're easy to hang, they look really fun and they're probably going to inspire you to play some more chess. Display.com slash chess is where it's at and there is a 33% off with the code chess it's just chess 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 everywhere and there is more chess coming up as we are about to go into game three of the big final between wesley so and magnus carlson currently the match is tied it promises to go down to the wire we are expecting more provocative chess subscribers stay with us as there's a fun trivia coming up just for you It's Kaya, roaming reporter for the CCT Finals. I'm going to give you guys a venue tour. So coming out of the elevator, that's where the players will be entering all their games every day, heading straight into the player lounge. So they can sit here, relax if they want. Coming in here, this is everyone's favorite place. This is where we have the catering. And the catering, Kanti, is awesome. Oh. Oh, yeah. As you can see, the best part of the Chess store is just right here. It's the pool. It's amazing. I'm having an egg burrito. Oh. I'm about to be so energized for today's time. Yeah. The food is amazing. Okay, enjoy your breakfast burrito. I'm going to take you guys in here. So I'm actually going to say this is where the magic happens. First of all, in the corner here, that's where I have my mix zone when I get to interview all the players in between games. And take a look at this. Take a look at all the screens, all the equipment. A lot of fantastic people are here to make this event happen. I did say that's where the magic happens. Well, actually, this is where the magic happens. This is the venue, you guys. A huge room, actually, and so much equipment in here. I actually heard we have 20 cameras rolling here every day 
to show you guys what's happening on the boards. Should I try a chair? I'm not sure if I'm allowed to open. Okay, loving the CCT finals and thank you for joining this venue tour. As the biggest chess stars are in Toronto, we are also celebrating with more. And this time it's the Chess Kid stars versus the streamers. That's happening on the 18th of December. That's this Monday. And you don't want to miss up, miss out on this big challenge as the phenom, the 10-year-old Fostioro from Argentina. He's just playing some brilliant chess. He's just 10. I don't know how he does it. He's challenging. Gotham Chess. He takes on, and this is one stream you don't want to miss. Use the command stars for more information on this. And right now, it is time for the stars which are shining in this city, and that is the biggest names in the chess world. And two of the biggest performers are fighting for the finals. The top prize, $200,000 on the line. And of course, crowning of the ultimate king of the champion's chess run. Look at that crowd. It is the fan zone in Toronto. Some big names there as well as we're being informed. Uh, we've got the chess bras. We've got grandmasters. We've got everyone enjoying chess. James, somewhere in the mix there. I wish we were there as well. That looks like a lot of fun. But two players for whom the fun has to wait. It is Magnus versus Wesley. That's on game three coming up. Two KG draws. Kaya caught up with Wesley So. Wesley So, you didn't seem to be in any sort of problem in that game with the black pieces. Do you agree? Yeah, well, so far, so good. Hopefully, I can maintain it all throughout the game. But it's actually funny because Magnus played this same exact line against me with the other color. Like, it was black, I think, in 2021. So, two and a half years ago, online. Yes. Good memory. No, well, that's the only reason I played this line, yeah? That's the only reason I studied this line because I noticed Magnus been playing this Knight F6 stuff. When I mean, actually he played it against me two and a half years ago, I've never seen it before. I was like a knight up six, but it's actually pretty good. Like it's really, really solid because usually you play knight b6 or, or but then it also makes sense to bring the knight to, over to the, to the king side to protect the king. So I'm not 100% sure if Magnus remembered our game, but actually we were following it pretty much all the way to, to the end. Like that game in the online, I was white and I had to win it. So I didn't really get any chances. But I think even this night B5 was played there unless I'm crazy. So is that why you basically didn't spend almost any time here? Or you were just completely in control on the clock as well? Yeah, because I just followed Magnus' game. So that's one good thing. I think when you're training in chess, people always ask how you train, how you train. And then some coaches, you know, suggest puzzles, all that. But I think it also makes a lot of sense to... I think it makes the most sense actually to analyze your rivals' games, like not just bits and pieces, but the entire game, opening, middle, and end. Like I learn a lot whenever I'm analyzing Magnus' games. And basically, the only time we've seen you in a little bit of trouble here in the finals is when you have been low on the clock there against Nordebeck Abdu Satoru. Is that a big part of your tactics here to just don't get into time trouble? Well, I'm trying, but it's easier said than done Definitely. because you kind of. Yeah, I think this position knight b5 was our game, actually. It's very funny. But anyway, I think it's definitely part of it. As I said, beginning the tournament, uh, speed chess is mostly psychological. Like, you're not going to calculate every 
single bit of detail. You just gotta move and trust your intuition. Like Boris Gelfand, I think he said that you make a move first and then you think on your opponent's clock. So it's definitely part of the job. But my time management has actually been very poor in, ga in uh, game one. The only reason game two is because I just followed his game. But uh, uh, yeah, for sure. Because if you get under two minutes, you can have a very good position, but you can lose it in one move. So got to watch out for that. Well, we're definitely going to see this match go to four games. What are the chances you oh, think yeah. we're going to see it go to Armageddon? Well, I hope Magnus not listening, but I mean, I wouldn't mind if both matches end in Armageddon because, uh, I mean, he's a better player, so he got more opportunities with more games. But if in Armageddon, anything can happen, so right. hopefully I can reach. Wow. Wesley wants it. We want it. Let's yeah, see if this it. goes to Armageddon. But first, game three. Back to you guys. Bobby Fischer famously said that he doesn't believe in psychology. He believes only in good moves. And Wesley's so there saying that speed chess is mostly about psychology, about intuitive play. But we've been seeing both these players burn so much time on the clock in the early moves. And we just heard Wesley being critical of himself, saying, I can't afford to do that, not against Magnus Carlsen. He also called Magnus the heavy favorite, saying, I hope Magnus isn't listening. I want Armageddon. So I, we never know with Wesley, how confident is he really? Is he just saying things to act a little bit like he's not the confident player that we know is capable of beating Magnus, as he did at the 2019 Fisher Random World Championship? And as he did a couple of days ago as well, in the round robin of the Champions Chess Tour Finals, uh, it is going to be a big fight. David, two games to wrap it. And Wesley made it pretty clear he's happy to take it into Armageddon. What do you think? Are, we gonna, are you expecting more aggressive, ambitious play by Magnus in the coming rounds? Potentially, especially in the fourth game. I think this next one, Magnus has black. He wouldn't be averse to something a bit more peaceful and uh, ideally with minimal pressure. A draw there, I think, would be great for both. Uh, but... Stylistically, I think it's difficult for Magnus, even if he has white, to press. Wesley's so solid. If you poke him too hard, if you wake him up, he'll come at you. And I can see Magnus getting frustrated if there's uh, kind of this flurry of draws, if he's not able to get any chances at all. Magnus has a history of lashing out from occasion or doing something a bit uh, kind of impulsive. So um, I think Wesley's got his strategy kind of all lined up, all worked out, and it's paying off so far. It's one of the pitfalls to avoid. Hikaru Nakamura has lost in consecutive years to Wesley So, in part because he plays for a win sometimes at all costs, and the cost is great here in the title match. Magnus Carlsen takes his seat. He gets the black pieces. $200,000 first place prize up for grabs. When there's a first place prize, his name is often etched next to that trophy. And we've spoken so many times about how Wesley's style just frustrates his opponents and makes them come at him, which gives him the opportunities that he is waiting for. Don't poke the dragon, the dragon will poke you back. And it's Magnus Carlsen who's first at the table. Wesley so still to arrive. I would be I would be shocked if we saw another 1B3 by Wesley to start with. We've been talking about these Mimi openings. He's done it against Nadebeck with success. He played it in game one. What do you think Wesley has up his sleeves for this one? Yeah, we see a handshake. Wesley did play 1v3. He didn't get a bad position, but he didn't get an advantage in the first game. This time it feels like he'll be more direct, more ambitious, <coughs> and we're about oh, to have liftoff. Stay hydrated. They get their drinks next to them. Uh, it's going to be a sweaty fight between these two players, depending on the opening that we get. Will it be, again, a solid draw? Or will we have more? 1e4? That gives me hope. It's the Sicilian. Sicil for the kill. And uh, Magnus, not just the Sicilian, playing pawn to a6 on this last move. That is ultra provocative. Doesn't fight for the center at all. It uh, allows White a free hand. It's a bit of a move order trick. It's kind of asking White to uh, open the middle of the board because then Black has much more options. But... I've nearly never seen Magnus employ this one, and I think already the frustration's building. He doesn't want another quiet battle. He wants fire on this board. So rare at the highest level that I often forget its name. I believe it's the O'Kelly variation of the Sicilian. It can transpose into other lines because in the Nidorf Sicilian from the black side, you often include this move A6 with the pawn going up to D6 next. So just asking Wesley, do you know all the variations? Do you know uh, what transpositions can occur? Maybe I can catch you off guard. And Wesley, he is spending some time here. He said he needs to avoid time trouble against Magnus Carlsen. I think playing D4 in the center right now is a good way to avoid that long-term pressure. 
And it's so important to not burn too much time in the opening because the critical moments will arise, the position will get messy, mistakes will happen, and the players, and the player who has those extra seconds in those moments, that's often decisive in this one. But Wesley does take the decision finally after spending a bit of time with that second move surprised by Magnus. He does take out the bishop to e2. With the black pieces in the oak alley, it's about getting that d5 break in early on. That d pawn from d7 moving two steps ahead. Is that something that Magnus is already thinking about? Or would you say his approach should be to start developing first before a central break? Normally, you want to get the pieces out, and I think this last bishop move from Wesley So might throw Magnus off. As you say, normally Black wants to break open in the center very quickly. You're kind of waiting for your opponent to commit, and you react accordingly. But White hasn't committed anything. White is simply developing. White's next move is natural, obvious. If Black does nothing, White will just castle his king. So uh, certain pressure on uh, Magnus Carlsen right now. If he lashes out a move such as d5, Black's queen would be forced out early. I think that might backfire. So. Um, I'm expecting a pawn push here or Black's knight to come out, uh, maybe the queen side knight. Either way, uh, Magnus, he's the one to launch the surprise. Uh, the O'Kelly, I must admit, I've forgotten that name too. It's that rare, as you mentioned, Robert. Uh, but OK, now we're headed into more traditional waters, uh, an open Sicilian potentially, depending on Wesley's next move. He pauses. Will he take with the pawn? Uh, the pawn? Will he take the pawn with the queen? Will he take it with his knight? Uh, lots of options here for Wesley So. And in standard knight or territory, we see white capture this pawn with the knight, and black's pawns are in normal positions. He does, in fact, take with the queen here. So if the black knight steps out to c6 to attack the queen, the queen will slide back in front of the dark square bishop. And I have to say, this kind of reminds me of some games that Magnus has played from the white side of this opening. So Wesley saying, you can do it. I can do it too. That was his uh, kind of mantra in the previous game. He did mention, Wesley, that these two had a battle in the previous uh, game, but with colors reversed from two years ago. Uh, so he basically, he's just copying Magnus's opening. He just says, OK, you often play 1b3, I'll play b3. You played the English opening a few years against me, a few years ago against me. I'm playing it this time. And now a variation, as you mentioned, Robert, that Magnus is quite renowned for as the White Queen most likely going to step back now. Uh, either to E3 or to the D3 square. Following the best player on the planet when it comes to opening preparation, perhaps not such a bad idea, but really interesting there. The memory that uh, Wesley has about all the games that they've played, even years ago, and just how they look at openings at the very top level. The knights come out, and I was expecting Wesley to blitz out the next move quickly. Well, he does pause a little bit, and he chooses another square. Instead of lining up the queen against a dark squared bishop, he lines it up against a light squared bishop. To me, this is a bit of a surprise, because putting that queen on e3 later on in white's white's rook to the d line, which is opened up already. But this looks like it's not only going to come in the way of the bishop, but that eventual rook as well. He does want to develop his dark square bishop, so he doesn't want to be in its path. And right now, Wesley, he can just develop his queenside knight. He controls the center. That's the good news. Uh, earlier, we were talking about a pawn break for d5 for black. You often want to accomplish that in Sicilian defenses, but Wesley has that square under his control. But now we're getting into sort of a Sicilian dragon territory, where Magnus is going to develop his bishop to g7. That's a long-range piece, and it's going to be a fighting game. I don't think it's going to be particularly solid from here on out. Yeah, this is the most uh, promising in terms of the rich possibilities for both players. Uh, the most promising position we've seen so far. And oh, something something happened. Did Magnus knock over a piece? Uh, players made the eye contact there. Magnus looked over for the arbiter. But OK, back to uh, pure focus, pure concentration on this board as Black's Bishop has been fian -kettoed. But yeah, this one, so many pieces on the board. This imbalanced pawn structure that we always see arise from the open Sicilian. Um, I'm excited. I think this one, it feels like Magnus is poking Wesley a bit. He's saying, come at me. I'm provoking you. Try to do something. Uh, but will Wesley be provoked? That is the big uh, question right now. Who gets provoked and how much risk are they willing to take? Uh, we're going to check in with Danny, who is on site. He is in Toronto bringing us some updates. Danny, two KG fights, but this one promises to be a fun one. What do you make of Wesley's opening approach so far? Yeah, thanks. I've been, like everyone else, I guess a little surprised and intrigued by Wesley's opening approach going back to playing 1v3 in game one. 
a lot of people see the conversation on Twitter. I joked that he might play 1B3, but I said it on the heels of a comment that I was very serious about, which was I didn't think Wesley would go back to E4, one, because of his lack of success against Noterbeck, the comments he made to me that he wasn't feeling comfortable with his preparation. And it's funny. And then Levy said, well, if he plays E4, we will kind of learn what Magnus's intentions are by whether he plays E5, going into some really well-known lines that Wesley can keep very technical and, and very sort of risk-free, or whether Magnus would go for a Sicilian. So I guess I wanted to pop on to just say that uh, in many ways, I think that a lot of the anticipation we've had and sort of the intrigue about what the players would be doing at the board is sort of coming to life here. And I'm a little surprised by Wesley going to E4, um, Magnus playing the Sicilian, but like David just said, I am also, regardless of how we got here, excited about what we're going to see on the board because I think this is about to be the most exciting game we've had yet. And Danny, that's an interesting setup for what's been happening, but now that we're in this position, whose style do you think this type of position favors? Is it in Magnus's court because it might be more open, or is Wesley dictating the pace because he is starting with the white pieces and it is closed at least for the moment? It's a great question. I, I mean, Wesley plays E4. We know that he, as he said, for many years was a big fan of some of the sharpest, most deeply prepared Sicilians. It hasn't been something he, he has done as, as uh, I guess, as often in his later years, as we say. He's still a pretty young guy. Um, but I'm going to go on a limb and say that regardless of who styled this favors, I actually feel like Magnus is happier about what we're now seeing on the board. It's a very unique Sicilian. Yes, it's a dragon setup, but you have a couple of very unique features in the position, right? The knight on d5 and this sort of structure is, is very irritating for black, but white also doesn't have as much space as you might normally have. The queen is interesting on d3. You see Magnus aggressively playing the pawn to b5, which means he's ready for a fight on the queen side, a very typical Sicilian plan. So is Wesley going to play something like a4 and try to maybe positionally undermine the queen side here? Uh, or will he stay aggressive in the center and allow, allow for an even sharper Sicilian? Things like bishop to g5, put a rook on d1 and e1 and see if you can make something happen. So anyway, I, I know I didn't answer your question directly. I, I kind of feel like it favors Magnus in terms of the kind of position he wanted. We also see a little bit of an edge on the clock, so that would be my, that would be my, my crystal ball prediction, I guess. And uh, Danny, I've got to ask, are you missing uh, Levy, James, everyone? Why aren't you in the bar? Why aren't you in uh, the Belfast Love right now? I'm not in the bar because I got work to do, uh, just like just like everybody else here. <laughs> and uh, I saw, I mean, obviously, Candy had a, had a good time over there, um, checking in with the chess pros. Okay, bishop to g5, by the way, excited to see aggress aggression from Wesley. Um, and Levy is over there right now. He'll be checking in soon. Spoiler alert for those who didn't know that or, or fans who were hoping to catch a glimpse of Gotham. He's, he's actually over there right now. Um, I think I'm going to head over there at the end of the day. I don't know. I want to be here just in case some crazy stuff goes down. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and I, I will definitely be there tomorrow. That's awesome. Chess over everything, Danny. We've been seeing the fan zone there, and it looks like everyone's having such a great time. Uh, what does it mean for Toronto to host this massive finals? I think for Toronto, the fans feel better this year than they felt about us last year. The Chess.com Global Championship didn't have a fan zone, and in the venue that we're in, we really didn't have any experience for fans. It was, I think, great for the players. We got a lot of compliments, uh, but the fans weren't really pleased. This year, again, we didn't go as far as we'd like to go. Ultimately, our, our uh, future is, I think, going to have even better experiences for fans. I'm hoping to, to deliver on experiences that are fans on site here with the players. Who knows, maybe even with it, with an ability to scream and cheer and shout when they, when they see things they like. There's a lot of, lot of ways we, we think we can pull that off. Um, so I think, I think Toronto is super pumped to be hosting uh, this event like last year. Obviously, the candidates is coming here. So they're becoming quickly one of the most, uh, one of the most global, globally visited cities in the world in regards to elite chess. So I think they're pretty pumped. And shout out to all the fans who, who showed up and made it. As we said, it was completely sold out. The bar looks packed. Um, and, uh, and there they are, right there. And we see a little bit of simplification. Sorry, my I'm, I'm in a chess brain. I know I'm normally the guy who's taken us, taken us away into the more, the more off-the-board stories. But I'm, I'm pretty fascinated by what's going on here because I have a feeling my prediction was wrong. I made a prediction out there that I thought Wesley would be so solid we could very easily get four peaceful results before Armageddon. But I have a feeling we're going to see some spice on the board here. So that, that gets me excited. And uh, hopefully the fans will be, will be pumped to see that too. 
Yeah, that was really cool to see so many people in Toronto excited about this finals and in the fans. And we saw Aman in there as well. And I think I spotted Maxime. Not really sure if that was Maxime. But it looked really cool. Danny, we yep. will check in with you. Lots of trades have happened in this one. A very different position. Uh, we're going to deep dive into this and keep us updated with everything that goes on there. Meanwhile, we do see a lot of trades on this one. But despite that, an ambitious, ambitious approach, just like Danny did predict H4. I feel like we lost him too soon because he would have loved to say something about this move. H4 for the score. Wesley is just trying to expand on the king side. He can also do the same on the queen side. And Danny was saying we might see some spice. Variety is the spice of life. We're getting all these different openings. And it's Wesley who's taking it to Magnus at the moment. Why not? He controls so much more of the board. Uh, right now, the queen side is undeveloped for Magnus. And H4, put that pawn up on H5 and just ask some questions to Magnus. Are you really going to develop your bishop to F5? Yes, you kick my queen away. I can just move my queen out of dodge, and then I'm still going to play h5, maybe f4, maybe g4. I can throw all my pawns up because there's no attack against the white king. Maybe a4 on the other side of the board to try and create more weaknesses. The material is level, David, but the pawn structure seems to imply that if anyone is playing for this advantage, it has to be Wesley, and all caution has been thrown out of the window with that last move. Yeah, this is Wesley. So at his best, this is Magnus Carlsen taking some big risks as he does attack the White Queen, which will surely just slide back. And uh, there we go. Wesley does play that move. Uh, I just wanted to mention the pawn structure. We've talked about White being super flexible on the King side with these three pawns potentially moving, mobilizing also on the Queen side. It's purely because in the middle of the board, White has this beautiful pawn on d5. In an endgame, it might become weak because it's very far extended, but for now, it clamps down on two of Black's pawns. Black can barely uh, challenge ever in the center. If you cannot challenge in the center, White simply has more space due to how far advanced this pawn is. The board is cut in half, essentially, so it's going to be very hard for Black's queen, Black's rooks, to travel between the king side, queen side, kind of switch focus very quickly, whereas White's rooks will be able to switch to the center. They will be able to kind of uh, zoom behind their pawns if lines open up on the king side. And um, okay, Magnus prevents the advance of this H pawn. I think that's a really important move. Otherwise, black would have been feeling uncomfortable with this king. But either way, I'm slightly biased here towards white's position just due to the pawn structure. Often uh, this kind of scenario really uncomfortable for black. This is an eternal weakness. That d5 pawn that David pointed out is what defines the position and gives any chances, if at all, to white here. And it's not as uh, easy as it might look looking at the material balance. We see more pieces being traded off. But again, this keeps the position alive. With the light, light squared bishop off the board, white can start targeting even with the f pawn moving forward. That last move by Magnus has weakened his king side a little bit. And with the light squared bishops gone, it will make black more vulnerable to attack than white. And Wesley's keeping his options open, but look at what Magnus has just done. He's sacrificing a pawn right now because if that bishop takes the black bishop on f5, you're not taking with a pawn. That opens up your king. That's not a good decision. But queen takes f5, and after bishop takes e7, I think Magnus is going to flick in a bishop f4 because that dark square bishop for white is going to have a hard time getting back into play. For instance, queen to d4, rook to e8. If you think you're getting away with bishop to f6, there might already be rook e4 uh, ideas here, uh, getting your queen out of line with this bishop on f6. And queen d3, I want to throw in one more a little funny tactic. Bishop h2 check. When their pieces in line with one another, look what happens when the piece in between disappears. King takes bishop, rook takes pawn h4 with check. You get my rook as well. White's up a handful of material until you lose your queen. Black is the one who ends up ahead. Beautiful tactic, beautiful clearance sacrifices there, Robert. But it's because white is slightly loose and white doesn't have time to activate the rooks and go for this pawn. I think, actually, this is just supreme calculation from the world number one right now, Magnus Carlsen. Maybe missed by Wesley, so it does look on a superficial glance that he's simply winning a pawn. But this suddenly backfires, and white, due to the trap nature of this bishop, or actually your move even stronger, bishop to f4, due to the fact white's queen is a bit loose, suddenly momentum black. And Wesley, so realizing this, not being greedy, I think uh, dodging a bit of a bullet there, he does shift his rook instead. So still eyeing this pawn indirectly, but uh, black now has at least mobilized yeah, that was, a, that was a stunning line that you just showed. Uh, and, and what's even more stunning is that Magnus, he just quickly found it and he finds the tactical way to get out and neutralize 
neutralize the position to the advantages that we were talking. But Rookie One still keeping the pressure. He doesn't go on for the trades. David, you were about to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say... Why not at least defend this pawn now? Black still has a beautiful bishop. And uh, despite the fact that these bishops, these light squared bishops might get traded sometime soon, now uh, white is unable to attack. If white ever pushes forward, black will happily step back either to the f6 square, g7 square. And actually, there's just too many weaknesses now around the white king. White will regret pushing so many pawns. So I think Magnus, just in time, has found a way to stabilize, hold everything together. And these bishops are the key. He's not giving way. He's trading on his own terms. This is really, really classy uh, defense in what we thought was a bit of an awkward position. And that d5 pawn, which is such an asset in the current position because it does restrict some of Black's pieces and that keeps a backwards pawn e7. Later in the game, it's going to become a target. The rook will slide to c8 and that rook can slide up to c5. If the bishops get traded, the light square bishops, that is, the rook can come up to c4. And suddenly it's that white pawn on h4 that may be a bit loose. So there are going to be some counter chances for Magnus Carlsen here that d5 pawn it can be overextended and for Wesley he needs to keep up the pace not just on the board in terms of creating threats but on the clock he's down under six minutes we were so hopeful about White's position just two moves ago we were talking about all these breaks coming up White having that deep on the bishops looking really good where does it come to what moment does it come to or what idea does it come to where Magnus has managed to uh, turn this around to at least an equality well sometimes uh the best positional moves are based on tactics, on tricks. And I think it was that one that Robert pointed out, just Magnus pretty much hanging a pawn, saying, that was a free pawn, try and take me, but the tactics work in my favor. And that's where momentum changes. It's going in one side's direction for so long. Suddenly, something throws you off. Suddenly, what you wanted to achieve isn't possible anymore. And then it's momentum for your opponent. And that's how games take this kind of roller coaster effect. And uh, they can be topsy-turvy because um, often, Things at this top level are very rarely one-sided. You might be going for a certain goal, as you might have a certain idea in mind, but the opponent always has resources to try and throw you off. And yes, Wesley isn't able to achieve a direct advantage, but he's not worse. It's still in the balance, this position. Uh, White still has chances, and I like this rook lift. And the evaluation bar off to the left-hand side of our screen here, it's still in the middle, and it has been both in this game and in the previous ones as well. But Magnus has done a few things in this match. That knight a2 decision, the... Thumbs up from the evaluation bar. It was a great idea. Here, sacrificing a pawn temporarily on e7, also a good idea. But the best players in the world, they know when to choose their moments. And Wesley knows when not to take a pawn that may be vulnerable. He understands that's biting off more than he can chew. He would be in an uncomfortable position. So Wesley, he is now just under six minutes. Magnus about to hit the seven-minute mark. And for Wesley, he's just doubling his rooks on the e-fire. I like the way he's handling some of these decisions from Magnus. They may be a bit of a surprise at first glance. Plans, but then when he sits and calculates, he realizes, not a big deal. Let me continue with my plan. Let me coordinate my pieces. And once the rooks do get doubled up on the E-line, there will be threats for Magnus for, uh, to answer once again with that F-pawn moving forward, targeting that bishop on E5. Again, coming back to that D5 pawn that we were talking about. It's just made E7 a long-term weakness. And that's where, that's kind of like Wesley's North Star, guiding his play, doubling up on the E-file, placing that bishop on G5. It's all around that E7 weakness right now. Magnus develops, also eyeing a potential rook lift himself once the bishops uh, get traded. The rook could come to C5, attacking D5, or also C4, hitting on H4 at the right moment. Yeah, and look at the body language. Both players sensing this is a critical game, a critical moment. It's really hanging in the balance. Yes, the knights are all gone, but the pawn structure is imbalanced enough. And uh, the piece configuration is really tense. It feels like one side could crack. And uh, Wesley hesitating here. He's one and a half minutes down. He does play the consistent, the most logical follow-up uh, to his plan, enacted by lifting his rook up the board. And now, how will Magnus react? Quick pace here, trades off the bishops. Your move, Robert, I think incoming. The black rook on c8 needs to activate. There is, for the first time in this game, uh, the hint of a threat of white's f-pawn coming forward, kicking away black's stabilized central bishop. So uh, Magnus wants to fight against that. And if white really wants to get that in after rook c4, you have to first play g3, but every pawn push in front of your king gives control of important squares to your opponent. So I would not be touching too many pawns in front of my king if I were Wesley, but you can't really 
push pawns on the queen side either. The B pawn is stuck in place defending the C pawn. So I think that if Magnus is given a few turns, he can bring his first rook to C4, then slide his other rook to the C file. And if white can't successfully get this pawn push to F4 to kick the dark square bishop out of E5, I do believe that Magnus will have the better chances there. So Wesley, he'll have to act quickly on the board this time rather than the clock. Yeah, it's all about that black bishop. If it stays on that beautiful central square, only Magnus Carlsen as black can be better. If Wesley is able to kick away that black bishop from the center, maybe by using a pawn, then things will get tactical. Things will get really sharp and uh, Wesley will hope that things go in his favor. That's why the black rook lands on this fourth rank, cutting across on, uh, that, uh, on that nice, nice line. And as you said, Robert, pawn to g3, giving the white king some breathing space, but also re uh, kind of preparing that pawn to f4 push. Getting so tense. And uh, five minutes each now on the clock. Still feels like we might have a winner in this game. It might be decisive, could go either way. Feels like far, far from the level, the sterile equality we saw in the previous two battles. And F4 is now a threat, right? Which Black has to sort out because you are targeting the E7 pawn. And if that rook stays on E8, you don't have the defensive resource of falling back to F6 anymore, guarding that E7 pawn. I'm just thinking that can Black actually try to fight the threat? We're challenging White's bishop on g5 with a defensive move like bishop f6 eventually. But for that, you need to move that rook from e8 out of the way. So I don't want to move it to d8. Let's say I double up on c8. Can White actually get to the e7 pawn immediately? Okay, by dropping back, this is your idea, Tanya. Yes. It's a challenge, and this is one of my favorite structures in chess. It looks like black structure has been broken, but uh, the doubled f pawns keep the black king nice and safe. I call it the bug house structure because in bug house chess, for those who play, uh, this is the way to keep your king safe. But uh, yeah, it's about whose king is weaker. Here it would be white's, and he does play your move. And uh, tactics potentially in the air. Pawn to f4 might actually backfire if Wesley isn't energetic here. Feels like black's bishop holds the fort. It is the glue holding things together. But it's enough, and Black's rooks uh, might be superior to their counterparts. Unless there's a sacrifice on e7, tactics suddenly... We can invert the move order. That's what I'm wondering about right now. Let's say I take on e7 first, so your queen is in line with the white rooks, and then I play f4. What's going on here? This looks like a messy position because I'm threatening to win a pawn on e5. I have both of my rooks there. You can't play this pawn push to f6 because your g6 pawn will be loose. So now there are questions that Magnus will have to answer. The white king is out in the open after pushing all those pawns. Yeah, Wesley, if he goes for this, he needs to mm. judge it correctly. This white king will be weak. There's various ways black can defend here. Yes, Wesley might even go up a pawn, but this white king with queen's rooks, all the major artillery on the board, I mean, this is so double-edged. So moment of truth. If Wesley oh. doesn't go for this, it might be too slow. I think I saw him reaching out. It's not the bishop. Mm. Again, a more cautious approach here. He's going for a rook trade. The trading pieces suddenly, we mentioned it. If black keeps the bishop, uh, sorry, on this e5 square, black is better long term. And uh, yeah, the black queen might come out at some point. Black can kind of curl up into a ball, put a king on g7, bishop on f6 at some point. I think Wesley might be losing the thread. He's reluctant to take a risk, go forward. But maybe he had to just be principled, be aggressive there. And it's a position where that d5 pawn is going to be something that white may struggle to hold because if that second black rook steps up in front of the c4 rook, go up to c5, put immediate pressure on the d5 pawn, and the black queen slides over, suddenly we could talk about Magnus going for a win, but I like his decision first. He brings his king up to g7, covers the f6 square again. Also, maybe in some positions, you need to cover the g6 pawn so you can push your own f pawn to f6 to kick that bishop out of there. But either way, I like the way that Magnus handles handling this and both players under four minutes is getting into territory where speed it can kill but it's needed here yeah feels like wesley maybe just needed to go for that take a risk be energetic after all you don't beat the best player in the world by being timid and i do foresee a position where magnus can start grinding that's where we know he loves uh, to kind of exert his authority over the opponents, even the best players in the world. If he gets a small advantage, like the weakness of White's far advanced pawn now, we mentioned it, trading everything off, that pawn is weak. So uh, Magnus has a few things long-term in his sights. Wesley needs to act dynamically now. And speaking of acting dynamically now, I just want to point out that this sacrifice of bishop takes pawn will not work anymore. And that all comes down to Wesley's last move. 
the whole idea falls apart because that rook from e3, which moved to e4, has actually cleared out a diagonal. And after bishop takes pawn, and perhaps we can show this with arrows, David, that this is the idea that we were vouching for earlier, which gives Wesley the play. Now f4 can be met by a check on a7, which earlier was not possible when the rook was on e3. So Wesley returns the favor, steps up with his king, sidesteps the check, bishop takes pawn, once again a threat. But he did walk into a new diagonal, which I don't like either, because in the current position, I believe that the black queen can slide to b7 in the very near future, maybe on this turn, with rook c5 to follow, or pawn to e6 in some positions, because the king is in the scope of that black queen on b7. This is actually a nervous territory for Wesley. So Magnus is just playing on the queen side completely with a5, saying my queen's in the perfect location. But I don't think that the white king is fully out of dodge. Yeah, Wesley's drifting. Look at this, pawn to a3. He's even just parked all his pawns on dark squares. And these could be easy targets for Black's bishop later in the game. I really don't like this for Wesley. So, and this idea of putting the queen on the long diagonal, not just uh, threatening tactics along that line, but also pawn to b4 will totally shatter the white structure later. Magnus, he's upping the ante, upping the pressure. This is a massive weakness. It was white's biggest strength earlier, suddenly. All these trades, and it is simply weak. Magnus is turning the screw. He controls all of the pawn breaks in this position because white's pawn structure is actually cemented in place. F4 is available, but we talked about that weakens the white king, and Wesley has not shown that he wants to get adventurous on that side of the board. He does do it now. The dark square bishop, it will retreat to F6, maybe after an exchange of rooks first, as we see Magnus take this rook, but that bishop is going back to F6, and there may be double pawns. I just don't think that's the important thing. The D5 pawn is the weakest. B4 is a pawn break available to black. And that king on G7 will, will actually be tucked cozily there with four pawns in front of it rather than just three. Yeah, we've seen it before, that uh, type of scenario, including in a game uh, with Magnus Carlsen against Fabiano Caruana. Yes, the bishops are going to get traded off. Yes, it might just be queens and rooks left, but king safety, it's paramount, it's key. And white's king, far more airy, drafty, uh, far more open than its counterpart. Black's king is the safest king you will ever see. It's just nicely protected. Wall of pawns in front of it. I think, actually, despite the evaluation bar only being slightly in black's favor, this one is already on the brink. Wesley has to be so accurate to hold this one now. And a uh, quick capture. Magnus has that beautiful wall of pawns now, the four uh, pawns in front of his king, and Wesley's forced passive onto the defensive. White's queen and rook, two heavy pieces, the best pieces you can have in chess. They're all guarding a mere pawn. This mm. is a sad sight. Wesley goes into the defense, which means he lets go of an open file as well, where we can see Magnus try to put his own pieces for counterplay. But it all comes down to the clock situation as well. Right now, Wesley's under two minutes, Magnus under the three-minute mark. And despite the level material, despite Black having those double pawns, we are expecting this to be a big fight still. Some more critical decisions coming up. There are heavy major pieces on the board. And we know just how deadly Magnus can be with those queen placements. And we typically don't like double pawns. And black is the only side with double pawns. Because in pure king and pawn in games, it's hard to create a passer. But with rooks on the board, when you have double pawns, you have open files. And why black should have the upper hand is he's been using the C file. And if that white rook did not go right back to E4, he could use the E file as well. So the black king has that blanket of pawns in front of it, it's a happy piece. The d5 pawn does stick out, but is there enough firepower remaining? That's the essential question for Magnus Carlsen. Uh, the d5 pawn can be defended by two of white's pieces, but it only can be attacked by two of blacks. It seems like Wesley is hanging on by a thread. If Magnus was to put that queen from d7, the first move that came to my mind was queen f5. Just feels like an active square for the queen. I'm pinning the rooks. If we imagine this position with the queen straighted off, who does that favor? Oh, I think Wesley would love the queens off because even if white ends up losing a pawn on the queen side, if all of the queen side pawns from A to D file disappear, then actually with four versus three just on one flank, black cannot create a pass pawn. That's the one downside of uh, having these doubled pawns that Magnus has right now. So I think actually a rook trade favors Wesley because he'll be safe. A queen trade favors Wesley, he'll be safe. Magnus, if he wants to win, keeps the queens and the rooks on. If you imagine the black queen or black rook ever entering the white half of the board, if they ever land on the second rank, yeah. knockout, game over. And uh, I think Magnus needs to keep the tension, try to maneuver, sneak in behind somehow. It's not going to be easy. Mm. Uh, should it still be a draw, maybe with best play, but Wesley is just devoid of a plan. Look at this. He's just putting his king uh, in the corner there. 
He's just waiting, seeing if Magnus can break through. I like the move, though, because now he's putting the onus on Magnus, saying, show me what you got. You uh, put your rook on b8, are you really going to play b4? No, he goes queen f5. And maybe he's now more inclined to trade queens because the white king is so far offside. So a queen trade, the rook slides to e8. Uh, this is a situation where only Magnus can play for a win, and he's going down this line. And that's so interesting because Magnus waited for the moment when Wesley's king was at the edge of the board. So not giving enough time to actually come to that F2 square to control, control all the penetrating squares on the E file. Only after Wesley played king H2, Magnus goes on for the rook pawn endgame. Is there, is there hope here for black? We always talk about the Magnus touch. Can he create something in this one? It's definitely possible. If anyone can, Magnus can. He squeezed water out of a stone more times than we can count. And this last move is really classy. It's actually a pawn sacrifice. Black giving away a pawn. White can actually take twice on this square, but the Black King is coming. It's all about rook activity. Black's rook on an open file, white's not. And king activity, the king's coming in. And it's not just about open files, it's not about open ranks. This is what makes Magnus Carlsen perhaps the best endgame player of all times. His pawn structure is ruined on the king side. Double isolated pawns, the F file, and ice upon the H file. But white is sitting passively. The rook on D2 needs to sit there on the second rank. Otherwise, black gives a check, wins a queenside pawn. If it leaves the D file, the D5 pawn will be loose. And now king G6, king F5, that black king is entering the fray. And if white king slides on over one square to F2, the black rook slides on over to H3 winning the h4 pawn. Wesley's going to go down a pawn. It's urgent. If black gets one more move, two more moves, as you said, Robert, if the black king activates, it's over. So he tries to shut down the entry points for the black king. Black's king now has no way to sneak into the white position. Uh, I think a really important move there from Wesley. So, and uh, Magnus, can he up the pressure? The problem is he's maximized. The black rook is perfect. The black pawns on the queen side cannot really advance any further. His other pawns are stuck. So it's all about the black king and inroads. He needs a route in. But he is winning a pawn in this position, like we were talking, right? The rook slides back to e5. There is no healthy way to keep that f5 pawn in the position anymore. No, there isn't. He can go rook e5 right now, but I don't think he will. He goes king f8 because rook e5 isn't going anywhere. Attacks two pawns at the same time. There's only one white rook to defend with it. I love that move, king f8, because what's Wesley's move going to be? If he goes king f2, he may just lose the h pawn, and that's a really valuable passer because it's not doubled f pawns. That f5 pawn is probably going to be lost eventually. Wesley's got to move, and he's down to 20 seconds. Wow, and a difficult endgame to defend as well. I love it. I think this might be Zugzwang, and uh, that's a term we say when every move for white worsens his own position. The white king had to step across, but now the black rook goes back, and the pawn drops with check. So even better, why not just give your opponent the move? Pass, and uh, they worsen their own position. Wesley's now desperately trying to break open lines, trade off pawns on the queen side. Will Magnus say yes? He doesn't need to decide yet. He does trade a set of pawns. I'm a bit surprised. Maybe he could have kept some tension there. But Magnus now is up a pawn. And can he convert? This is the question. Wesley defending heroically so far, but it's only Magnus who can win this one. Do not hurry is the theme of this endgame. That king move, king to F8, just making Wesley's position worse. How quickly he's able to create his chances in this endgame, that's taken me by surprise. And we see now Wesley trying to build a kind of a fortress, just relying on the fact that Magnus has the doubled F pawn, which gives him hope to hold on to this endgame. A big problem for Magnus Carlsen, all of his pawns are isolated, so you can't get a connected pass pawn situation. He moves his king into the center. This endgame reminds me of the one against Gukesh, which Magnus was able to outlast the junior a super strong Indian player in but he's going in with his rook he's going to target the C pawn as well but Wesley's getting active not sitting passively to defend that is so important and now both players are playing on seconds on the clock Magnus has this amazing ability to recognize equal but difficult to defend end games and combine that with his sheer will to play on till the end to just play for a win till the very end and that's what makes him the greatest player of all times when it comes to endgame but will it be enough in this one with Wesley getting active? Ooh, big question Wesley's king now doing the right thing marching up the board forcing the black rook away but the king's getting dr driven back now this one is so close between being a draw and a win for black Magnus he's trying he's probing but Wesley has all the answers so far this activity look at the white king going back where it came from I think Wesley's defended this perfectly under 10 seconds, Magnus now, he might have lost control. And White's Wesley's, king is coming in. Yeah, he's using his king as a weapon. And there could be some mating nets around the black king. The rook on a7 makes sure that the black king cannot jump up the board. But now we're going to pass pawns on opposite flanks. Black already has established pass on the b file. White's going to win the h5 pawn. It's going to be a pawn race. And there's still one extra pawn, but it's all about who gets those pawns moving first. But it looks like Magnus's pawn is closer to queening than Wesley's. 
Magnus's pawn is closer, but Black's rook is trapped on the wrong side. You always want rooks behind past pawns. White's rook is keeping that black b-pawn under lock and key, and why has he allowed the black pawn to run? His king could have stepped across. His king could have stepped across, but he was worried about black pushing the b-pawn and delivering a check. But right now, can't that pawn go all the way up to f2, and the rook will go to h1 to stop the pawn? It may sacrifice itself, but black's pawn cannot be stopped. Black's making a new queen. Magnus Carlsen is going to win. Wesley forgot to keep that pawn under watchful gaze, and... It's game over. A couple of checks, spite checks. Magnus's king is going to dance easily out of them and now just prevent the white pawn promoting. We see a check, first of all, and Wesley resigns. Wesley resigns. Magnus Carlsen does Magnus things in the endgame. Takes the point, takes the lead in the finals with the black pieces. What a win that was. It was reticent play from Wesley So and Magnus Carlsen pounce. He senses it when his opponent doesn't want to strike. Wesley had to do it earlier, and Magnus is the first to deliver a huge blow in this final match. He does deliver that blow in classic Magnus Carlsen style and starting with two draws at the start of the day. We move on to Magnus Carlsen taking the lead, which means game four, Wesley has to win on demand. It's a must win for Wesley, so or Magnus Carlsen will take set one. And we've been talking about Magnus Carlsen being the greatest player of all times in the endgame. David, did he just prove that one more time? There's no doubt Magnus Carlsen is one of the best endgame players in history and that was just clinical. He started the endgame level material. Somehow Magnus managed to work things in his favor. Wesley defended so well for so long. 40, 50 moves he defended, but ultimately he did crack, went low, low on time. And I just wanted to point out in the pawn race, the critical moment, Wesley simply didn't have enough time on the clock to hold it. And it was here that after pawn to f5, Magnus racing with two pawns, not just one, Wesley did fall apart. He pushed his own pawn when he needed to track this pawn, the F pawn, with his king. He should have stepped back, and he was afraid here that the white king would be vulnerable to checks. But after pawn to b3, do not take this pawn. After you take this pawn, you will get checked from behind next move. No matter where you go, black will promote and cost white his rook next turn. But instead, it's now a race. Now you push your h pawn, and after this pawn steps forward, you use black's pawn as shelter. You step in front. This is so difficult to find. Maybe with 30 minutes on the clock, he would have found it, but not with a few seconds. And white's pawn acts as just enough of a distraction to save this game. Instead, after pawn to h5, we saw black win the race. The pawn pushed, and at the very end, White had to resign because simply here, Black's Rook will stop the pawn on the next turn and Black's pawn will promote. We often see this concept of an umbrella pawn when someone's attacking. You leave the pawn in front of your king because it doesn't open a file. Here, it could have been used in the end game so that the Black Rook couldn't free itself to deliver a check and allow his own pass pawn to promote. Impossible to find with no time on the clock. Wesley gave it his all, but Magnus, he was relentless. He did not allow Wesley to escape easily and he was able to convert for a full point. Magnus Carlsen with his endgame touch. He just always plays on until the last drop of hope is squeezed out of the position. And this time he scores the big win. Wesley, he kept up the defense but eventually crumbled under pressure. It's advantage Magnus and overall it's advantage Toronto because everyone there is having so much fun right now in the fan zone. And we've got Levy joining us so with everyone there. Levy, what was the reaction with that crazy race, that endgame that we just witnessed uh, in the fan zone. Yeah, Tanya, thank you. And by the way, great call there. Uh, the reaction was spectacular. We got a roaring amount of applause. This is basically something that you would imagine if the Maple Leafs or Canadians or any other uh, Canada-based hockey team would be playing on a Friday. What is today? Friday. So I think today's Friday. The pub is completely full. The venue is packed to the brim. We got people here with chess sets playing in the back and they were screaming, applauding. So the advantage is 2-1 Magnus, and we'll see if Wesley can fight back. And Levy, what's the reception been like? You're there, everyone you know, is excited to meet you, I'm sure. And I see Fabiano and Maxime behind you as well. So what are the fans, you know, are they enjoying their experience getting to meet some of their idols? Oh, it's incredible. Uh, absolutely amazing. I'm actually lowering the average ELO of the stage here. I've got Fabiano Caruana, I've got Maxime Vachelagrave, Amon Hamilton, chess grandmaster, and world chess boxing champion at this point. Uh, so I'm just super pumped to be here. I interacted with some of the fans behind me. I didn't even know that 
Uh, your plugs had wires still in 2023, but this is super cool. This is the only way I can hear you guys because it's so loud behind me. Uh, it's incredible. I've never seen anything like it for chess. Over the last couple of months, I've done a couple of book events in, in, in the States, also in London recently. I was going to have one here in Toronto, had to postpone it, but it will happen in January. And I never thought I would have four or 500 people under one roof all cheering at chess on a screen. So, guys, I think we're doing something right. And, Levy, we heard that pl players in Toronto, all these fans that were rooting often for Wesley So, were they a bit disappointed to see Magnus win it, or they're just happy to see great chess? I think they just want to see as many games as possible. Uh, they would be excited if, let's say, one of the players won 3-0, 3-0, which is the minimum amount of games you'd need to win two sets. But I think they just want to be here because uh, they got drinks, they're having a great time, and the more games we have, the merrier. Lavi, I see Fabi and Maxime behind you. What are they looking? Are they playing music? Because it looks like a DJ pose to me, or are they watching chess right now? Yeah, I don't need to continue to be reminded that I'm a lower rated player than the other people to my left, but thank you, Tanya. Yes, there are very strong Super Grandmasters here. They are analyzing games. The games are being broadcasted live to a massive audience behind me, uh, and it's actually kind of tough. I'm not sure they can hear. Everybody's chatting, having a good time, playing some speed games against each other, but there is a chess bro broadcast going on on Twitch, maybe on Kick as well. So they're just deep into the action, and we're getting insights from two of the world's best players. We're getting insights from a chess boxing uh, Savant and Amon Hamilton, so I mean, you can't ask for anything better than what we've got going on right now. Damn. Lucky Toronto. That looks like a lot of fun. Levy, we'll catch up with you later. Been awesome chatting and say hi to everyone there for us. Hello from Oslo. <laughs> Levy Rosman is down in the fan zone having a lot of fun and Maxime and uh, Fabi having a lot of fun there and the fun doesn't stop for Magnus Carlsen after the champion's chest tour, he will be uh, trying to defend his World Rapid and Blitz championship title as well lots of chess coming up and so important to get the momentum going in this match for Wesley So as he faces the world number one things are not looking good right now the darkness behind Magnus is on the board for Wesley but Wesley has to strike back in this upcoming game four <laughs> we have some puzzles. You did this last year, right? How'd you do last year? Yeah, I did very poor. Well, I, I, <laughs> White to move. Ten White seconds. Move. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Again, another one that I've seen, but I don't remember the solution. Yeah, of course, um, he's seen them all, of course. Um, okay. Time. Um, I think it's A4. So A4 is incorrect. Okay, in game, you know, you like those. Come on, you got yeah. this one. Uh, but not sacrificing three points and then winning. <laughs> You actually are on to something there. What you got? Do you have H5? What okay, it takes. Play? Okay, now I got another 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to guess that it is uh, It's A4, okay. bishop A3, and then I think it's, it's knight C5 there. Nope. That's what it is. You no. got to reverse it. Reverse this. Flip it around. Flip it. Flip everything. You're close. A4 is in there. So the problem is in my mind, it's like I'm trying to recall something rather than calculate. <laughs> rather than calculate. Right, because right. because like, I know I've seen, seen it. it before, right, correct, but, correct. Um, this one I might actually fail because, like, I mean, it's probably H5. Okay, it takes you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And here, of course, there's a debate. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. G6. Yep. Take. Yep. E6. Got him. Bishop A3 is Got forced. Him. And this is like the only moment that will trip me up. Oh, wait, I can, I can play knight C5, take. No, wait, I'm not. Is it, it's, it's, I think it's uh... H5 takes, G6 takes, yeah. E6, yeah. Bishop A3. Yeah. And then white looks totally lost. <laughs> <laughs> Give away two coupons for nothing. I mean, on the glance, I would guess H5, GH, G6, right. yeah. E6, yeah. then knight B4, Easy. and the pawn queen. And yeah. an A4, exactly. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. And yeah. I think it might be G6. Correct, FG. takes. E6, bishop uh -huh. A3, knight B4, bishop B4, A4. E2, ah, stop the cock, stop. He keep going, that's it, that's it, you got it right. E6, bishop A3. Let's go, Dennis, okay, bishop takes, one more. A4. Let's go, let's go, ah, let's go. Take a glance. H5, H5, H5. yeah, GH, yeah. G6, yeah. takes. FG. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, e6. Okay. Bishop a3. Bishop a3. Yeah, only me. Yeah. Then knight b4. Bishop takes. A4. Got him! Let's okay. go! Um, <laughs> Wait, do I have knight b4, take a4? That's it. Okay. There we go. Dub! Come I, on! I don't, you know. Got I, it. I don't know what it is. No, the problem first. is I need a fresh one so that my yeah. mind is not actually trying Correct. to remember. Because then I spend like five seconds we trying to remember. We need fresh ones, guys. We need yeah. fresh ones for Hikaru. He's seen them all, guys. He's seen them all. No, Hikaru has seen this one. Recall test for him. So, you seen it before? Right, white the move, 10 seconds. Uh, I know it. Oh, I'm you sorry. saw this one? I know it. Okay, I'm well, sorry. go ahead, definitely tell the camera yeah, what we got, I'll man. Yeah, I'll just say Queen of Five check. Oh, yeah, Queen of Five check in the end. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's probably my least favorite type of puzzle. Yeah, correct. That is 100% correct. I've seen no, it, but, it, like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't... Yeah. Ah, it's so annoying because I, I don't <laughs> want to... Uh... No, I would go with perpetual if I, I, I if I, I was playing in place or in bullet, yes. Be real fast. <laughs> but, but, yeah, no, 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 that's not the solution, of course. No. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, bro. I'm gonna guess that it's bishop takes e6. Nope. Nope. Okay. Knight f6 or something. Knight f6, baby! Okay! <laughs> he got the right move! But she gotta finish it, though, bro. He got that chip in his brain, bro. He got the chip. Knight f6. Exactly right. Throw the iPad. Like, what is this? No, no way. No way. <laughs> no, way. <laughs> no, 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 no way. <laughs> okay, no, I, 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 I would, yeah. I, of course, I would, if I would think like one hour or. Yeah, yeah I would, you would probably find you know, it. Yeah, by, yeah by, right. Yeah, so knight of six, bishop takes c3, e3, f3, and then after king takes g6. Oh, there's queen to f5 and bishop h7. There it okay. is! Throw the iPad! Ah! Queen f5. Ooh, oh. heat! He got it! Let's go, fight row! Let's go, baby! Yes, sir! <laughs> Ah, queen f5. Come on, there it is. Yeah. Nice, very nice. Very nice. That's a pretty one. That's a pretty one. Very hard. Nice. It's been very difficult. Yeah. Well, I'm interested to see how. I guess Hikar would be the best here. Yeah, in or maybe Firuja. Yeah, well, we have to recall kind of. But, he's actually seen it. Yeah, I have, one has seen it before. I, but I have no recall. chance. Congratulations on winning the event. In fact, I mean, uh, okay. getting the. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just waiting for the check. Then. <laughs> waiting for the check. But we warmed you up, <laughs> Wesley. You feeling thing. warmed yeah, up, yeah, baby? Yeah, Come yeah. on, man. Flexly so here. Yeah, thank well, you very much. Congratulations on all your success, man. We'll see you in the tournament. I hope I can fuck my queen like that. <laughs> Please, we'd love yeah. to see it. I think he's going to lose on the clock, Wesley, if he doesn't lose on the board. He still needs to save it on the board, especially after that last move, White's for it getting active. Wesley's smiling. He knows it's going to be all over soon. 20 seconds and Magnus wins. Wow, look at that. Magnus Carlsen in Armageddon finally beats Wesley. So and look at that reaction. That is huge. Wow, David. What do you take away from that? I've never seen the world champion that emotional. There it is. The final game and the final win for Magnus Carlsen in the 2021 season. What a performance it's been by the world champion to win the tour overall. Wow. First result uh, today between Magnus Carlsen and Wesley So. Magnus Carlsen takes the lead. The winner of the match, the winner of the Wellswater Champions Chess Tour 2022 and the winner of the Tour Finals. Leaving the San Francisco arena with a slight smile on his face. He is a true champion, Magnus Carlsen. Carlson is the two times champion of the door, looking to strike thrice this time. And these two have quite the history between each other. They've played each other a bunch of times. And Magnus Carlson with a massive 32 to 17 leads. And look at that number of draws. But no surprises there, given Wesley's solid style. But Magnus Carlson leads that head to head. And he leads set one of the finals of the Champions Chess Tour after that game three win. And Kaya did catch up with the end game maestro. Wow, what a game. Magnus Carlsen takes the lead. And what a game, Magnus. What was the breakthrough here? I think um, one big factor was that, um, I mean, this, is, this was... Um, like many of my games, Wesley, actually, that he's doing well. Uh, he's even a bit better, um, but he's playing like a little bit too apprehensively. Um, and then I sort of use that to eventually create chances, um, give him and give him some choices. And you know, once it comes down to time trouble, it's it's not easy. Um, so I thought, um, yeah, I thought it was um, was a good 
psychological game. Um, yeah, once he um, uh, once he started to play passive, I was just trying to see can I ke can I keep the game going? Can I get any chances? And uh, yeah, I'm happy with the with the way that it went. Yeah. They said quite early in this game, our experts, that this is this feels like a game that is such a balance between a draw and just somehow a breakthrough and a win for Minus. Did you also feel like that for a long time in this game? Yeah, well, I think I was definitely worse at first, but yeah, eventually it felt like um, I was the one who's, who's pressing for sure. The only time really we've seen Wesley in trouble in this tournament so far is in time trouble. So is that a big part of your tactics against him to get him into time trouble? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, I think this is uh, also what happens when he starts to feel uncomfortable. Okay. Now, a game four with a draw, you will be the winner of the first match. What can we expect? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I didn't really expect to win this one, uh, so I haven't thought too much about it. But, um, you know, uh, we'll see. Didn't expect to take this one. Is it just about taking the chance when you feel there is one? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I didn't have any chances at all in the first two games, and uh, it's a little bit like like yesterday or the match with Fabi. I didn't get so many chances, so when I get them, I need to take them. You definitely did in this one. Thanks, Magnus. Uh, good luck in the next one. Thank you. All right, he took his chance, and he's in the lead. Back to you guys. And Wesley needs to take his chances because a really key insight there by Magnus Carlsen that Wesley is playing apprehensively. David, there was this moment that Wesley could have taken the pawn on e7 with his bishop. But again, just cautious play for him and that seemed to have cost him big. Yeah, he could have gone for some tactics and they weren't unfavorable for Wesley. He just needed a bit of courage. He needed a bit of composure as well. But uh, ultimately, Wesley tried to take the quiet way out. But in the end, though, this was a signal for Magnus Carlsen. Just a hint of weakness, and uh, Carlsen capitalized. So here we see the handshake, the players getting ready to start. Wesley needs to be braver in this next fight. He needs to be brave, because if you don't take the fire to Magnus, he will burn down your position. And that's what happened in Game 3. Wesley must win with the black pieces. Magnus Carlsen needs only a draw. What will he start with? And... Oh! Was that hesitation? No, he goes with 1e4. Does that surprise you? In a game, he only needs a draw. It doesn't surprise me at all because Wesley So loves playing e5 on the first move. And Magnus feels, I can just force the issue, make a draw, send this to the second set with a 1-0 lead. So for Wesley, he might try out the Sicilian defense, but it's not in his comfort zone to have to play for a win for move one. And he does play the Sicilian, and Magnus... Puts a pawn on C3, the C3 Sicilian, the Alapin Sicilian, as it's sometimes known. And this is uh, renowned for its safe uh, tendencies here for white. Often a bunch of trades happen in the center at the very minimum. Sometimes white even gets an initiative uh, if black is too uh, kind of obliged to fight here. And OK, knight coming out, pawns pushing. What do we make of this? A good choice from Magnus Carlsen? A great choice from Magnus Carlsen, and not just because I played this opening my entire childhood. I think it's incredibly safe. Unlike in some other Sicilian lines where files open, we don't get a symmetrical pawn structure. If we look at this position and Magnus can push his D pawn up to D4, we're keeping pawns on the same files. So he's not allowing Wesley to get small pluses, maybe a semi-open line here, or a possible rook sacrifice for a minor piece like we see in the sharpest Sicilians. Really good call from Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, really interesting to see this opening uh, dynamic that we're getting. Magnus chooses the king's pawn opening, inviting Wesley to go for the Berlin because the math situation doesn't allow that. And that's where Wesley feels the most comfortable. So Magnus draws him into an opening that perhaps Wesley doesn't want to make but doesn't have a choice to, forces him to go for the Sicilian and then keeps it closed with the Alapin. Yeah, and uh, this queen capture I'm slightly surprised by, I must admit, Magnus uh, in the World Cup that he won earlier this year in the final game of the whole World Cup against Pragnananda, just needing a draw with white. He employed this opening, the Alapin, but uh, it wasn't with this variation bringing white's queen out so early. He just took with the pawn, played more classically, shut down that game easily, made a draw, 
and uh, won the tournament. So I'm slightly surprised, Robert. And normally we don't bring our queen out so early because it's easy to kick that queen around. But the black knight, when it eventually lands on the c6 square, white will pin it with his light square bishop. So Magnus trying to figure out what move to make right now. He could take this pawn on d6. Uh, the dark square bishop will have trouble taking it back because that queen eyes across to the g7 pawn. So we're just looking at this position. Magnus, he doesn't want to take too many risks. He doesn't want to give Wesley that feeling that he has even a chance. But he doesn't want to spend too much time either because we saw that backfire for five on a car one against Magnus Carlsen in their game four where Fabio was up two games to one. Yeah, and it's always precarious. Uh, it's always tricky, this situation where you want a draw. It's in the back of your mind. But you shouldn't necessarily aim straight for it. You shouldn't play for it, let it affect your decisions too much and uh, end up taking negative kind of suboptimal impractical decisions. And uh, right now, Magnus in the tank for a minute or so. Um, it feels like he's kind of torn in two minds. Does he play ambitious, aggressive chess and maybe uh, kind of take a route out later if a draw presents itself? Or does he really try and force the issue, try and trade off as many pawns as possible, pieces, uh, everything? Uh, right now, Wesley shading his eyes. Magnus not known for his death stare, but uh, Wesley uh, really here, his body language focused purely on the board. I think he should be relieved at least that uh, Magnus is the first one to blink, to think. Yeah, and that's quite a tank that Magnus is on right now. He's uh, touching the 12-minute mark very early on, takes the decision to develop the bishop instead of grabbing that d6 pawn, still inviting the black knight to jump in to development via c6, hitting that queen on d4. But I do like this approach by Magnus uh, of just continuing with development. Even if he's surprised with this last move by Wesley, he takes what is the common principle of openings. And I think he's just sort of preying on the fact that Wesley has shown a reluctance to trade too many pieces in a must-win game. Even in that Armageddon game against Nordirbek Abdus Sitarov yesterday, that final game of the epic semifinal between those two, there were moments where Wesley could have initiated some trades. He instead backtracked with his pieces. So in the center right now, there could be a trade of a pawn, a trade of a knight. But why would Wesley want that when he feels like he needs to win some more pieces on the board, at least in theory, sound like a good thing for Wesley? Are you surprised? We saw a bit of a shake of the head from Wesley. He was looking down at his fingernails there, just thinking, ah, oh, he doesn't look too positive. Um, but this position is still full of life. There's only been a trade of one set of pawns. You've got to be, uh, you've got to be focused. You've got to just block out the results of the earlier game. I was just about to say that do you think that's because of what has just happened in game three as well? Because everything was so under control with Wesley in in that opening, getting that position with the bishop pair, the pawn on d5. We felt he was the one who was putting pressure. But then that lack of courage in that one moment where he didn't take bishop takes pawn. And are these thoughts that would haunt you going quickly into game four? Well, he's a competitor. And a competitor in any game or sport, when you just lose a very critical game, you're going to feel it. And unlike in a classical chess tournament where the next game starts a day later, you had to quickly maybe get some refreshments, go to the bathroom, and then sit down at the board again. So how could Wesley not be upset about what just happened? He does have a decent position here. He's trying to shield his eyes from his opponent because he needs to play the position at hand. Mm. And then you remember you're playing Magnus Carlsen. He doesn't give you too many chances to begin with. And in a position like this, we're still early uh, part of the game. But out of the opening, I don't think Magnus is particularly unhappy. Yeah, Wesley continues to shake his head. Chess is not only a battle on the board, but an inner game as well. And right now, for Wesley, it is about just trying to forget what has happened. A game that was in his control, but messed up in the end. But you have to let go of that and focus on the board right now, Wesley. Now, to me, knight c6 would be the obvious move that you want to blitz out. What are the other options or perhaps development ideas that Black can be looking at here, David? I, I just think bring the knight out. Bring the bishop out, trade off pieces, get castled. It's actually quite straightforward. I don't think you have to be uh, too sophisticated about it. He does hit the white queen. I'm expecting him now to maybe trade off a set of pawns in the center. Just go back to basics. When in doubt, especially with the clock situation, just speed up, just uh, trade off, get the black bishop out, get castled, and only think later. The game is still in its infancy here. Uh, I'm really shocked to see Wesley in the tank for this long. It is the hardest thing in chess, the thing chess players hate the most, to lose with white. But he has to forget that now, has to recover. He's got black, he's out of the opening in decent shape. And OK, he's doing the right thing. He's getting ready to castle. Focusing on the basics right now, but for Wesley, it's all about creating chances. A must-win game. And we are going to head to Toronto, where uh, we've got Danny joining us right now. Danny, a difficult, difficult moment for Wesley. 
Yeah, thanks, Tanya. And uh, everyone's stuck with me right now because all of our other commentator guests are still at the fan zone having a great time, Canty Levy and the crew. But, yeah, I just was going to jump in to say tensions were, were high. The emotions were, were really big for Wesley after that game. He kind of quickly exited and, and did what he does a lot, which is grab his iPad, and then he leaves, he leaves the room because they're not allowed to have electronics in, and then does whatever he does to prepare. Gets fully fair play scanned back in when he comes back. But normally you see a slightly, uh, a slightly I guess, more stoic uh, Wesley, but he, he wants this bad, and he was, he was frustrated with how that one got away from him. We saw early, right? I mean, we all called it. You could see there was decisiveness in the air the moment that sort of odd, unique Sicilian was there. But... Uh, Pretty tough to lose with White, and now now has to find a way to get the dub with the black pieces. Danny, you're a father. You know you also are a friend of Wesley's. Looking at him on camera right now, I mean, what do you think he's feeling, and what are your thoughts about what Wesley has to do to try and win this game? It's tough, yeah, because you know Wesley uh, is 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 such a such a sweetheart, and um, I think really thrives in the environment where he feels kind of comfortable and confident, and I want to say supported. And I think when a game like that gets away, he, like anyone else, I think is going to struggle to forget it, especially in these formats that we have now. With very, it's very fast paced. It's awesome for all of us, the commentators and the fans, but it's difficult on the emotions of any human being when something like that happens and you don't have time to to take a walk and take a breath and and shake it off right so often the players you can almost see them in their own head they're sort of doing the mental therapeutic work on themselves while trying to solve their next problem which in this case is actually I think a very big problem that Magnus posed for him it's a smart one to play the Alapin Sicilian obviously we know that these lines can be I guess I'll say very difficult for White to get in serious trouble, right? This is not an English attack night or if this is not a Yugoslav attack dragon or even a con Sicilian. This is a position that, as you can see, it's very tame. The pawn structure, borderline symmetrical. There's not a lot going on here. And so I think the Alabin was a very smart choice. And an interesting note that with Magnus's 2A6 in the last game, Wesley went for the very sharp D4 line and loses time with the queen, even when technically playing an Alapin structure, C3 or even C4, are actually the more common moves there. So Wesley didn't want to get something tame when he had white. Now he regrets that there's something so tame on the board by Magnus because it's going to make it hard for him to win. The win is what he needs at this point. And you were the first to call out in Game 3, Danny, when you joined us, that you have a feeling that this is going to be the most exciting perhaps a decisive game uh, of the day so far. And I want to ask you, with the dynamics right now, playing the black pieces, the Alapin on the board, and so much pressure of trying to create chances, how are you expecting this to play out? How, how do you foresee uh, this one developing? Well, the good thing is I think Wesley, no matter how heartbroken he might feel right now, you look at him and your heart goes out to him because he knows he's fighting an uphill battle. He's not going to go down easy here. He's going to make sure that we have drama on the board because, look, a draw is just as bad as a loss, right? At this point, one of the cool things about the format is in the set setting, if you lose 3-0 or in Armageddon, it's only 1-0 heading into tomorrow. And he's been down 1-0 before. It was against Noterbeck in the semis. Magnus is different. But I think Wesley understands the dynamics. He knows what's at stake. This isn't going to stay tame. The moment he gets any, any bit of an opportunity, he will look to mix it up. But again, the problem is this is a position that will come with an inherently large amount of risk to mix it up because there aren't a lot of natural structural weaknesses in the position, as I'm sure David and Robert will, you know, all of you will do a better job explaining um, than, than myself. But it's going to be tricky, right? You got you to gotta take your chance if Magnus slips even just a teeny bit, or you have to try to create something out of nothing, which is going to come with a lot of risk. Mm. Yeah, difficult, tough spot for Wesley. Danny, we will check in with you as this one is uh, developing. Uh, thanks for those insights. And uh, meanwhile, the Alapin fight does continue. Still a closed position, still Wesley trying to create chances along that diagonal. The, white, the light squared bishop for Wesley will land on b7. So perhaps in the future, we can expect some activity on the long diagonal. Yeah, this uh, last retreat by Magnus Carlsen, uh, I had half an eye on the evaluation bar. It did slide down slightly, and uh, it does look provocative. It feels like Black has a very tempting first move. I'm not sure what the follow-up is, but uh, Magnus now, he's inviting Wesley forward. And mm. as we've spoken about in previous games, sometimes you have to jump on the opportunity. You cannot be timid. Um, yes, this bishop is really well placed on the diagonal, but it will get there anyway. So uh, maybe jump forward with the Black Knight. 
profiting from the fact that the White Queen, okay, he plays it, the Black White Queen has retreated to a vulnerable square. And I think Magnus's idea was to come back. I'm not sure which square exactly he wanted to use, maybe this one. Uh, now this knight is a bit loose, threatening to jump forward with his knight to hit the Black Queen. But even if the Black Queen preemptively slides back herself, suddenly this knight is on a beautiful square. If you team it up with this bishop, long term there will be potential tricks. And uh, there's nice juicy holes on the light squares if you can get to them. I think Magnus wants to bring his knight forward, but now this Black Knight at the very least drops back, maybe drops back this way and at least there's easy play. It's uh, nothing decisive, of course. Magnus hasn't made a big blunder or anything, but a bit clumsy for white with this bishop struggling to get out and uh, easier moves for black. We started with a Sicilian, but this resembles a French defense. And Wesley So, he became a grandmaster on the back of playing the French defense. He loved that opening uh, growing up. And this position, it's really nice for black because you have that active knight on f4. You're going to put your bishop Fianchetto in the long diagonal. And for Magnus, maybe he's playing a little too timidly. He knows the result he needs. He just wants to make a draw and get out of here with a one set lead. But Black does have legitimate chances because the pawn structure is not symmetrical. We have a four on three advantage for Black over on the king's side. We have a knight in enemy territory. There's a d3 square that that knight can hop into. And the most natural move is bishop to b7. The Black Queen will slide back to c7. Uh, the, this type of position is one where there's an imbalance and I would definitely prefer Black's chances. Yeah, feels like he's achieved a lot. And if White is forced to take this knight ever, then Black has this long-term advantage. This is something you can play with forever. You have, sorry, my arrow's going crazy there. You have the bishop pair. The two Black bishops will wreak havoc across the board a bit later on. And uh, this feels like the type of position Magnus Carlsen would be begging for with Black. And uh, this time he's stuck on the white side. Yeah, I just want to continue this. Uh, it doesn't matter because bishop b7 wasn't played. And I was just wondering if white could neutralize that bishop pair, the key advantage you were talking about, with ideas which still exist in this current position that we have on the board. At some point, perhaps the white bishop will trade it off uh, for the light squared bishop once it lands on b7. First, preemptively, Wesley so steps back with the queen. So now whenever there's a knight jump, there isn't any attack on that black queen. But the last two moves by Magnus, right? The queen was on the center of the board. It was on a nice e4 square. And just two moves, it finds itself on f1, voluntarily getting itself there. Is that a sign that something's gone wrong out of the opening? Definitely. I doubt Magnus envisaged uh, this game and kind of planned to put his white queen on such a passive square. The queens are the most active pieces. We've seen a lot of dancing from both uh, kind of both queens here, but it's definitely the black queen that sits in a superior post. White's queen will need to activate. I think she's uh, she's kind of banking on this fact that she can support white's bishop going to a6, as you mentioned, Tanya, trading off the light square bishops. That's the only reason Wesley paused there. But uh, ultimately, Magnus is not gone according to plan. And uh, he hasn't done anything too wrong. It's uh, kind of as Danny alluded to, White doesn't have any real weaknesses to probe at, but certainly uh, Wesley's got everything he could have dreamed of. So many pieces still on the board. S this small imbalance of pawn structure and uh, the game is alive. That's already step one. And if I'm Wesley, I avoid what Tanya was advocating for, for White to do, that bishop a6 trading off the light square bishops. Maybe he pushes his own pawn to a6 to eliminate that possibility. You want more pieces on the board. Uh, we've already seen that preference from Wesley. So if that bishop takes the knight in a four, yes, that's a trade, but we get an imbalance. Black has the bishop here. It is an open board state. So I think that Wesley would not be unhappy about this kind of trade. So uh, I'm with Tanya. I would avoid this light square bishop trade. We'll see how Wesley continues as he is a minute behind on the clock. Yeah, this is one to avoid right now. The bishop's disappearing because suddenly less ammunition simply, less control over the light squares. So pawn to a6 would be a really classy move from Wesley. So I think Magnus's idea is to plant a knight in the center in the near future, try to trade off uh, these little beasties. And still white is solid, but uh, Wesley so has enough to cause some problems a bit later on. He's thinking so long, though, on some of these turns where if Wesley was confident feeling uh, in the zone, you would expect the moves to be flying down on the board. It's just instinctive stuff. There's no right or wrong here. It's just stylistic choices. And Wesley, it feels like he's racked with self-doubt right now. It's just this position when you have to win the game. It's so uncomfortable because you're not playing your normal just okay if I don't win my opponent played a great game congrats to them we move on to the next one he needs to win and he is a solid player that's his nature he doesn't want to take unnecessary risks but when you're in a must-win game you do need to make uh, speculative decisions you might need to sacrifice a piece just for some play to cause your opponent to get scared and Magnus does not look scared he's not scared of anybody he's just chilling 
Magnus is chilling. Wesley, perhaps not so much. The most natural looking move on the board, the bishop development. You really don't want to make it because it allows the trades as we've been talking about. He puts the other bishop for now on f6, so a more active square again. Just bishop b7 is the move you want, but you're avoiding white's bishop to slide to a6 just for now. And uh, Wesley, it's high tension. And if you're feeling the same kind of stress that Wesley is right now, what you need to do is listen to some lo-fi girl music. And Chesscom has a cool lo-fi girl track. And you can check out your favorite tunes on any of your favorite streaming platforms platforms youtube spotify soundcloud they're all there play some chess to a lo-fi girl music chill out to some lo-fi girl music it's the one you've been listening to at the start of the stream it's pretty chill wesley not so chill right now not so chill you can tell wesley he's barely kind of broken away from that uh, really tense body language he's just been focused on the board which is great but sometimes in chess you need to take a step back you need to just kind of get an o a general overview of the board and kind of get out of your own head, at least uh, kind of calculate, but don't uh, kind of stew, don't philosophize, especially in these rapid, rapid games. Six minutes left on this board. It's pretty much blitz now, but Wesley, he's not had to make too many difficult decisions. Feels like the kind of momentous occasion, it's catching up to both of these players, especially with their time usage. So if I'm understanding correctly, you're telling Wesley to calculate, but not over everything. Yo, it's, sorry, James. Sorry, Dante. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> calculate uh, enough to uh, kind of get the moves down on the board, but don't think about the previous game. Don't think about the match situation. Don't think about the opponent who's sitting opposite you. Just uh, focus. It's these 64 squares, these uh, remaining pieces. And he eventually played Bishop F6, which is a very good move, but it cost him a lot of time. So what you're saying, uh, it could be anything, but for Wesley, it shouldn't be Carlson over everything. <laughs> <laughs> the champion's <laughs> chest over everything. <laughs> it is the champion's chest, the final set one, which is on. This is the game four, and Wesley so has to win on demand, given his must-win situation. The fact that he's playing perhaps the hardest, the most difficult player on the planet, let alone uh, in this situation, it's going to be a tough one for Wesley, but he's managed to create some imbalances, some chances out of the opening. That knight nicely planted on f4. If white ever wants to give that up, it means parting with a bishop pair, which gives a long-term edge to black. The move that we've been advocating, a trading off the light squared bishop, there are problems associated with that. You'd love to get that on the board, but visualize the bishops come off the board. That knight from f4 can further then jump to d3 once uh, the trades happen. Happen, and I think this would give black additional chances to fight for the advantage. If you're going to play bishop a6, you probably have to take that knight off the board first. And then black says, I am happy that I didn't develop my light square bishop yet because now I can trade without having spent a turn in between. And I think the best piece on the board for Wesley So right now is the 17th piece, the clock. Magnus, he has spent over three minutes on this very turn here. He's down to about five minutes himself. It's not like this is a clarified position, pure end game, I'll just shuffle around. There's some big decisions for him to make. Yeah, I think he will take this knight eventually simply because there's nothing else. There's no other appealing moves. That black knight is too strong. and White struggles to get fully organized while it survives. Uh, but he's burning so much time because top players, they're really reluctant. Um, it's one of my biggest, uh, biggest weaknesses, for example. I'm so attached to the bishop pair. We're kind of ingrained. All we talk about, bishop pair, that's a big success. You've got them, survive the opening, survive the middle game, and you'll win the game eventually in uh, the end stages with this bishop pair. So he's just coming, uh, kind of overcoming his prejudice here, his kind of uh, ingrained bias of these long-term advantages. Ultimately, you just have to snap off that knight, just play on. It's still relatively balanced, but Magnus struggling right now. Four minutes on this one move. That's half his remaining time on this one occasion. He's feeling the nerves too. He's human, Magnus Carlsen. At times, he can be. But right now, he has made the move bishop e3. So not going for that knight trade that we were looking at. Still keeps the tension on the board. Uh, what he wants to do is slide with that a1 rook on the edge of the board to the center of the board. Again, the idea is to trade off as many pieces as you can to try to get closer to that draw. And he goes for the idea that you suggested to stop bishop from landing onto a6. So the move a6 not only hinting at a future b5, which you want to be careful about because you leave behind some of the dark squares, but more importantly, you take away a key idea from Magnus here. You take away the key idea of trading off the bishops. And bishop b7 coming up next? 
Absolutely, and the best part of Wes's move, he played it quickly. Mm. We've heard the best players in the world say that it's better to play a good move quickly rather than the perfect move slowly. And Magnus, he is now down two minutes on the clock, under four minutes from him. We know it's a big moment for both of these players. Maybe Magnus is also susceptible to the nerves, and he's trying to figure out, do I bring my rook to the D file, start training a pair of rooks? I think for Wesley, you trade maximum one pair of rooks at this moment. You can't liquidate fully. I think it was Emmanuel Lasker in the early 1900s when he said, when you find a good move, look for a better one. But in today's time and age, you find a good move, you find a decent move, you might as well make it, especially in this format, or you will get flagged. Yeah, <laughs> simple as that. And I was going to ask, have you ever seen Magnus spend this much time in a rapid game? We're only at move 17. When it's relatively quiet, when it's quite straightforward decisions, uh, it's not too sharp, not too complicated. Uh, I must admit, I'm really, really surprised the way Magnus Carlsen has been handling that clock. Uh, the position is still fine enough, but yeah, definitely nerves kicking in, I feel. It's strange, especially when we compare it to the previous game. Right? He was playing uh, with the upper hand, had lead on the clock. This match has been one defined by two solid games to start and then some apprehension, as Magnus put it, from Wesley in game three. And it's Magnus who's been apprehensive in this game. He played an Alpin Sicilian, a quiet line, but now his queen's on F1. It's not participating the way he would like. One pair of rooks is uh, able to be traded right now. He can do that and he in fact, does. He could have played that move a lot more quickly, but Wesley intelligently takes with a piece that's not the rook. His rook is tied to the pawn, two squares in front of it, and he keeps more pieces on the board. I also really like that because even if that pawn was defended, Robert, taking it with the rook would invite another exchange on the board with White's rook sliding further. So Wesley wants to keep as many pieces on the board. That defile doesn't matter right now because that's where the trades will happen. Meanwhile, Magnus does capture the file right now. Rook d1 on the board. Wesley can slide back with the bishop from where it came from, an active post. He's managed to get the knight to a nice spot. The bishop on b7 is on a good diagonal. How do you see him making progress from here, David? Well, firstly, I think Wesley should play a quick move. He adjusts a piece, teasing us, teasing his opponent there. And uh, I just love the fact he recaptured that rook on the last turn with his bishop instantly. Uh, if he keeps that momentum, keep playing quick moves here, uh, then you'll put Magnus under even bigger pressure. He literally has double Magnus's time. Um, I've, I'm loving that bishop coming back where it came from. Maybe the black knight on c6 can just get out the way, leap out the way of black's light squared bishop at some point, unleash that beast, unleash that uh, kind of diagonal. And yeah, I see so many ways to improve. I'm not sure whether there are any big threats created, but uh, just speed up, Wesley. Keep that lead on the clock. He's looking for tactics because there's that bishop on b7 staring all the way into white's camp. Knight takes g2 does not work here for Wesley so, but you know he's considering because knight takes g2 if you take back with the queen. Knight e5, suddenly multiple pieces are hanging. That knight is pinned to the queen behind it. That light square bishop can back up, right? He can go back to e2 just to defend that knight. But you need to look in this direction if you're Wesley So I think at the starting point, knight e5 first is available because the knight f4 loses defender, but there are going to be tactics at play here. If you take on f4, I take on f3 with check, then I pick up your uh, bishop on f4, and white's kingside is in shambles. So you need to be really careful if you're Magnus. If you're Wesley, don't try to cash in too quickly by sacrificing pieces. Yeah, he's suddenly calculating something, but he spent so much time. It's definitely the nerves making these two players freeze. We saw it with Abdus Satorov yesterday in the semifinals. I like this knight move as well, just hinting that you might sacri uh, kind of capture and shatter the white king side on this square. He puts his bishop on e7 instead. Bit of a cagey one. I'm not sure how that improves things. Maybe he's going to try and line up on this diagonal as well. With a bishop on this diagonal, uh, kind of a corresponding bishop on the other diagonal, some big attacking chances long term, but it did cost him a bulk of his time advantage. So still really tense. We're really favoring Black's position, I feel. But uh, will it come down to nerves in the end? That's the big question right now. When you're playing against Magnus, you have to make the most of every single minute detail in the position. And that clock is not a minute detail. It's a big one. For Wesley, the advantage on the board is based on his piece activity, piece placement. But bigger than that, it's the pressure that he can put on Magnus on the clock. So he needs to keep the speed up, even if it's about not finding the absolute best moves, but keeping the pressure going. Meanwhile, Magnus trying to trade off as many pieces as possible to ease out any attacks, any tactics related with that knight takes pawn idea that you were talking about. He improves further the position of the queen, but advantage Wesley scoring the bishop pair.
Advantage Wesley. It's not just the air quality we see in front of us, it's the peace quality. And Black's got the superior queen, the superior bishops, now kicking back White's light squared bishop. Uh, momentum definitely on Black's side. And now he can potentially afford to trade pieces because long term, the two Black bishops will gain in power the more pieces that disappear from the board. They'll gain in scope. And uh, wow, committal move by Magnus Carlsen opening up light squares around the White King. Robert, I saw your face there. The black light squared bishop is loving uh, the fact that this has just happened. When there's an enemy Fianchetto bishop on the long diagonal like this, you typically don't open up even more. But more important to Magnus is kicking that queen out of there. There's luft created for the black king, so there won't be any back ring checkmates. But now that Wesley brought his queen to g4, we see the makings of a checkmate attack. If the queen and bishop can line up on that diagonal, that white king is in a world of hurt. Yeah, Magnus has to be so careful, but look at Magnus's clock, 1 minute 30, and counting, suddenly big threats, Black's Knight, just any move, literally jumping out the way, will unleash terror along the diagonals now, and look at the Black Queen, she's just lurking nearby, Magnus must be feeling uncomfortable, he took half an eye, uh, half a look at that clock, and... He needs to move, he needs to decide. He would love to get the queens off at any cost here, or the rooks off at this point, but even that is hard to achieve. Because queen e4 trying to trade the queens, that rook on d1 is loose, loose pieces drop off, and there are many loose pieces in white's position right now, so Magnus, he's dipped below a minute. Wesley sells three plus uh, to his name. This is looking like it's dangerous territory for Magnus Carlsen, and he tries to eliminate some of the danger by trading the queens. Yeah, I think a good practical decision for, for Magnus, especially low on time, you don't want to walk into any checkmating attacks. You don't want to allow your opponent to create these nasty threats when you have no time to react. That being said, we mentioned it, end games will favor black still. And uh, Wesley, he can try to hustle Magnus there. Will he be reluctant to enter an end game though after his previous experiences against Magnus in that phase of the game? That's the big question. And that's a really important one because you reverse the colors right now and Magnus would blitz out the queen trade, blitz out the knight trade and go on to play this bishop pair endgame and probably squeeze a big win out of, uh, well, I can't even say nothing here because the bishop pair is uh, something. But for Wesley, does he decide to keep more tension on the board given the math situation or play a position where he's fighting for two results but really only one will work? That endgame, it's either playing for a draw or a win with black. What do you think will be his uh, final decision here? How would he approach this? And he's touching the two-minute mark as well. Magnus under a minute. Process of elimination. I think he has to trade queens here because white's next move, if black doesn't hang the queen, is to put the bishop on e4 and trade off even more pieces. So I don't think Wesley has much of a choice. In fact, trying to keep more material on will backfire. So trade queens and then... Count your pluses. You have the two bishops. He does trade those queens off the board. There is that long-term advantage. It's pawns on both flanks. The bishops should reign supreme over the knights. Yeah, especially in the dark squares. Black's dark squared bishop is uncontested if it can ever sneak behind. White has pawns on the queen side that are uh, sitting on that color complex. So still long-term trump cards. But I think he's too afraid of Carlson, the endgame maestro here. Anyone else in the world, he'd be trading off a set of knights, he'd be playing quickly, confidently, trying to improve the black bishops, bring the black king towards the center. Uh, everything that we're taught to do from a young age in that endgame stage, but you are playing Magnus Carlsen and suddenly the time advantage is pretty much gone. Knights off the board as well. It is two bishops against bishop and knight. Can Wes Wesley squeeze this one out? It's uh, not going to be easy. I always say in Armageddon, you have to be shameless. Uh, you know, this is not an Armageddon game, but it's a must-win game for Wesley. He brings his bishop out, putting pressure on the knight. If he gives Magnus an isolated pawn, that could be another something uh, in his back pocket, a small plus there. But Wesley, he's looking away from the board. He's calculating with his ear. Yeah, that body language by Wesley isn't the most confident one that I've seen. He does make the moves that are the correct ones, but takes his time. And now it is uh, Magnus who's touching the 30-second mark. Will we see further rook trades? Not for now. Magnus moves with the king. So he's inviting Wesley to actually capture on d4, give up the bishop pair. But in compensation, Wesley will get a weakness off that isolated queen spawn. Do you think it's more important to keep the bishop pair? Wesley deciding not to trade. Yeah, do not trade because taking that knight would also most likely lead to a rook trade. You don't leave yourself with enough pieces. Yes, white might have one weakness, but you need two in order to win any endgame. You need two weaknesses to probat. Uh, so keep as many pieces on the board as possible. He's now hitting the white knight, kicking it back. The rooks do disappear, but more importantly, he has the bishop pair. You need as many imbalances as possible here. It's the bishop pair and the four versus three advantage, uh, the four versus three lead in pawns that you have on that right flank.
and White has a three on two on the left hand side of our chessboard. So you can start pushing pawns yourself if you're Magnus Carlsen. But when you push a pawn, you may leave uh, new squares. Uh, assess, accessible, excuse me, to the black pieces. So I like the look of this endgame for Wesley. You throw your pawns forward. He starts with bishop c6, but f5 and e4, those type of moves are coming. But this could be the moment where Magnus uh, tries to challenge this bishop pair that we're talking about, and he does it with the move bishop to f3, and Wesley immediately declines it. It is the biggest plus in black's position, but this in return gives Magnus a very active spot for his own bishop and d5, targeting the f7 pawn. The knight can now jump into play. Uh, first, he blocks down that queen side. Now, a threat on the board. That bishop from d5 can go to b7, starting to attack the queen side pawns. Yeah, will he dive in with his Bishop Magnus Carlsen, go for Black's weaknesses, those pawns can still push? No, he's simply trying to trade off as many pawns as possible. Now a bit of a threat to advance this white C pawn that's just moved one square further, uh, fixing it on a nice protected square, a pass pawn for good forever. So most likely we'll see a trade. And uh, the more pawns that disappear, the closer Magnus will get to that desired draw. Although one bit of bad news for Magnus Carlsen is that his pawn on b4 is on a dark square. To defend it with another pawn, also on a dark square. Only Wesley has a dark square bishop. And oh, he's actually offering a trade of all pawns on that flank, hoping his central pawns will do the trick. But I think you don't want to see all these simplifications happen. This yeah. is surprising, David. Lock it down. I think Magnus now can advance. Okay, he actually does go for all the trades to try and eliminate pawns. I would have been tempted to step forward there because black dark square bishop suddenly would have been locked out of the game. But no, it's uh, liquidation time. He's trying to go for opposite color bishops here, Magnus Carlsen. He might have saved himself. And I think that's the key move. Knight c4, it forces the bishop trade. Yes, black gets an extra pawn, but it's not going to be enough anymore. Knight c4 was a defensive key resource that Magnus was relying on. We've seen this story before earlier in the set where it was Magnus up a pawn. Here he's down a pawn, but the opposite color bishops, there's no hope. You have a light square blockade. The dark square bishop can help you in that cause. But Wesley, that move, a5, he could have tried for more at that moment. Just trying to liquidate the queen side was not the way to go. And it looks like these are the last few moves being played off set one. Magnus Carlsen on the brink of taking the set away. This is going to end in a draw. This is a creepily similar mirror image to that earlier game with opposite color bishops. It is a draw piece on this board, but Magnus takes the set. Set one to Magnus Carlsen. Wesley So has to strike back in set two. Wesley missing some opportunities right there to make Magnus sweat just a little more in that endgame. He allowed the pieces to be traded off. You see Wesley looking to the side. He had legitimate chances there. He was outplaying Magnus Carlsen, a tentative Magnus Carlsen that we don't typically see. But with what we do typically see is Magnus Carlsen and victory. He won the first set over Wesley So by winning game three. He earns a head start as we go to a best of three. Tomorrow's a new day, but Wesley So needs to right the ship quickly. Magnus Carlsen there takes a set one. We saw him shaking his head at the end. He's always critical of his own play despite the result of the match at the end. And it is true skill that even when you are not playing at your best, or at least according to you at your best, you still find ways to beat the very best in the world. Magnus Carlsen takes the lead with his win in set one. Wesley So has to strike back tomorrow in a set two to take it to set three. That game, David, not, e not an easy ask for a player to create chances with the black pieces, but Wesley managed to do just that. Wesley did manage it with black. That was the dream. He had a small but long-term advantage. Ultimately, however, it didn't prove to be enough. But it was a case of history repeating itself with Wesley not choosing the most decisive moves, maybe taking the safer approach when he should have risked it all. And it was here that things did start to fall apart. He has the advantage. We talked about the bishop pair. These bishops are beautiful on these perfect diagonals. And I was shocked to not see Wesley start to throw pawns forward on the king's side. This is the side he's strong with a pawn majority, push the pawn to f5, bring the king towards the center, push the pawns until they can't be pushed any further. Instead, however, he started to retreat. He brought his bishop forward, first of all, dodged this, this bishop trade, but suddenly white got active, white with a strong bishop, and a few moves down the line. After being offered this pawn trade, he did actually trade everything off on the queen side. Pawn to a5 was the final mistake. If instead he'd played bishop to d4, trying to come in and behind, still some winning chances. However, pawn to a5 did allow the sequence we saw in the game. Opposite color bishops, Magnus sacrificed a pawn, but dead draw.
Wesley allowed too much activity for Magnus' pieces in the end game. What Magnus does best is he restricts his enemy pieces. He is allowed to keep the pressure because of that. So Wesley, he unfortunately didn't play that F5 move. He would have had chances, but when all is said and done, Magnus, he held steady. He made the draw. He got the result that was needed. Cautious games at the start of this set one, but when Magnus had his opportunity, he strikes. For Wesley, those moments were few, but he missed them. And that was the decisive factor in this set one. Coming up, there is a big one. And what do you think Wesley needs to take away from everything that's happened today and switch up for tomorrow? Well, it's what Magnus said. I think that Wesley was apprehensive. Even in a moment where he had a good position, he had some pressure, he didn't actually push forward. He held himself back. And Wesley, he's a very accurate player, one of the most accurate players of all time. He rarely loses, but then he rarely plays Magnus Carlsen on this stage for $200,000 first place prize up for grabs. And Wesley's played fantastic chess this entire Champions Chess Tour final. And he has to find that same courage going into day two uh, right after this set one. Uh, Kaya is right now with Wesley. Let's head over to Toronto. He is uh, standing here thinking, Wesley, so this uh, day one in the finals definitely didn't go the way you wanted, I guess. Wesley, how are you right now? Yeah, I think my play was okay. I mean, I was just wondering if I had any real chances at all. To save the third game or to win the fourth game, but I couldn't. I couldn't find any. I think I was. I mean, I'm, I mean, I think my play was relatively okay. I, I should. I should. Didn't really have lost the third game. I was uh, like uh, kind of panicked. Didn't realize that the end game posed any threat. Like I underestimated his G5 business. Uh, I mean, it should still be a draw, but I mean, I should have just grab that one like HG, FG, FG. And then I'm sure, like after rook e5, then I probably play some b4. And I'm sure it's a draw. But yeah, the way I played is really dangerous. I think it was still a draw in the end with his rook on e5, king d7, king f4. But uh, uh, yeah, as practically was very difficult with seconds on the clock. Um, we did have Magnus here after that game three. He said that he felt it was a psychological win. Do you think he was able to get inside your head a little bit today and that that was the problem for you? Well, it's been in my head for many years. Huh? Actually, it's getting better. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I'm getting better in, in that regard. Uh, but it did, I have to say also, I was looking at you in game four. It seemed that you were still... Thinking about game three, it seemed that you were a little down, that you were maybe completely in that game four. No, I mean, Is that just, correct? No, not really. It's just, I'm used to it. I mean, it's just, you know, you don't really want to lose a white game in such a short match. That was really crucial. So, I mean, I've come back from defeats many times in the past. So I, I'm used to it. wasn't really thinking uh, what went wrong. You know, it is what it is. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's kind of inexcusable to lose a white game in a short match. Um, now, also, I was wondering what opening to play against uh, against one e four. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, as long as I have chances, you know, I I'll keep playing. I mean, everyone knows Magnus is a better player. I think if I was playing somebody else on game four, I think I might have gotten good winning chances because the position was quite tricky, and with the bishop pair, I could play on. Maybe queen g4 was a mistake, because after knight f4, I thought I could take knight d4, queen g4, knight f3, king g2, knight e5, but he has bishop e4, which is very fortunate, actually. If he doesn't have that, then he's probably just losing. So it was pretty close. I think general, my play was quite okay today, but my time management and uh, also during time scrambles, Magnus is just much better, so I have to keep an eye on that but uh, yeah I wish I wish I could play a bit better than it would be a real match well you mentioned the word chances in here and there's definitely still chances you have one four game match tomorrow and then potentially and hopefully for you a third match so yeah what needs to be a little different tomorrow for you to be able to make that comeback well I tried tweeting today huh? it didn't really work so. No tweets tomorrow. Maybe no tweets today and tomorrow as punishment. <laughs> we'll see if there are any replies. But uh, so I, I didn't tweet the other day and then I lost another back. I tweeted today and lost. So maybe let's try no tweet. But I mean, I'm not really superstitious or anything. I just try to keep the same routine every day and, and uh, uh, what works. I mean, I'm 
very pleased also, by the way, with the co collaboration of Chess.com and the Champions Chess Tour to bring two different people together. Uh, but, uh, you know, last year was a bit easier without Magnus. So that's the only, <laughs> so that's the only thing. I mean, sooner or later, you're going to have to run into, into Magnus. So, um, you know, if I, I'll try to, as long as I have some life left in this match, I'll certainly uh, give my best and just, yeah, I mean, try to make it a, a, good, a good match for, for the fans. I think, like, Fabi played really well in the semifinals. It was, I didn't see all the games, but I, I think it was very exciting. I hope I can do the same, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome, Wesley. No tweets tomorrow, no tweets but he's going to try. No tweets today. He's going to try no for a couple. Well. No <laughs> tweets. So no, no, no need to go into Twitter, but uh, tune in tomorrow because this guy will try for a comeback. Back to you guys. There's definitely a life left. Uh, Wesley so has to win uh, set two for that. And I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. Magnus Carlsen lives rent-free in his opponent's head, but Wesley needs to find a way to get uh, Magnus out of his headspace right now for that big one. And we're going to head over to Toronto for more breakdown on the action. Thanks, Tanya. And just like that, we have one of the matches in the books. Magnus Carlsen takes the first set in this title match here. And Magnus, we, uh, we saw Wesley say at the end that he won the global championship last year here, but he said sooner or later he knew he would have to run into you here in Toronto. <laughs> were, you, were you at home wishing you were here last year as you watched Wesley win this? I wasn't thinking that much about it. Like, Honestly, the the match between Wesley and Hikaru was such a slug, you know. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. the draw after draw after draw, and nothing was happening. I was thinking, yeah, fine, let them do that. I don't I don't remember what I was doing, but yeah. uh, I was thinking that, yeah, I don't want any part of that. All right. <laughs> well, today you got the job done. Take us through that game three. When did you have a feeling, despite playing the black pieces, but that 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 might be the game where you could strike? I think game three was all psychological. Okay. I mean, first, I I was definitely worse from the opening, but I guess when you play A to A6 and move to kind of expect that. Yeah. Um, and then first I offered him a pawn on E7. He didn't take it. Uh, I don't think he had much if he took it. So that was an okay decision for sure. Uh, but later on, Phil felt like he was playing a bit apprehensively. Uh, and when he played f4, weakened his position, I was thinking that, well, the position is equal, but now I have a chance. And first of all, psychologically, I have, I have a chance here. Yeah. And that has, yeah, as I mentioned before, that has really been the story of my matchups with Wesley for so many years, that the way that I beat him is that I just... You know, I hustle him. <laughs> that, I, I, I mean, I use like his sort of lack of aggression against him, right? Mm. And bluff him sometimes, and so okay. yeah. I mean, because he generally plays really well. Like he makes very few um, positional mistakes and so on. So I was trying to keep the game going. I guess it was a draw for a long while. Like he did really well to create counterplay, but yeah, eventually yeah. I. Um, I, uh, I got there, and um, um, yeah, sometimes you have matches like this where, you know, um, there aren't a lot of chances for either side. Obviously, he, hasn't, he had some chances in the last, last game, but, um, you know, when you get that one chance, take it. Take I need it. to take two, it. Two days ago, you had a 2-2 match with Fabiano, two wins, two losses, Armageddon. Uh, do you prefer that type of close match that ends that way, or do you like... I mean, today it felt very, very tense, but it did feel like you just had a little bit of apprehension from Wesley. Do you like the hustle win, or do you like a back-and-forth, kind of more, uh, you know, decisive results both ways? No, I kind of prefer the kind of match that I had today, except that... I mean, I would have wished to there to be more of a progression, like I put pressure, I put pressure, and then I break through more than nothing happens and suddenly I get a chance and break through. But, I mean, it does feel really good to win on a day where where I really felt like I took my only 
my only chance. In fact, it seems like you have a lot of energy today, like the game, even you just, it seemed like you were really in form today. Did you do anything the last 24 hours to contribute to today? <laughs> no, um, not, nothing too much. Uh, I guess the only thing is that the last couple of days I haven't eaten before the, um, before the round because I felt like I've been eating too much and <laughs> feeling super sluggish yeah. some of the other days. So I thought like, Let's go with the clear head yeah. theory for the first game, and then eat a little bit uh, throughout the um, um, yeah throughout the matches. Very smart. It's great. Hearing your thoughts is awesome. We actually wanted to throw some stats at you while we had you here and show you what your uh, performance is looking like on paper. Um, I guess these stats are interesting. You could say that 98.1 percent, 96.43 percent. Your thoughts on how well you played today when you see it on paper? Uh, I think. As I talked about earlier, it some, says something about uh, the complexity of the games. Yeah. Uh, and especially game two, like, I couldn't have made any mistakes even if I had tried. Yeah. <laughs> because there was just nothing uh, going on. But yeah, it felt like the first game was fairly correct one. And in the third, I felt like I didn't do anything especially wrong. I just took my chances. So, yeah, I'm not surprised that the the accuracy is. is I was going to say. I mean, j jokes aside, obviously made an interesting stats joke. But I, I really wanted to share yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it's not like that joke is overused by now. 100. percent But I did it because I wanted to ask you specifically, like, what is it about Wesley? You two guys just we've seen matches one where someone is 95 and someone's 85, right? This was this was a game, uh, several games where you guys are just really grinding each other. I guess, like you said, you had one chance and you took it. And you expect more chess like that tomorrow versus Wesley? Yeah, I, I, it goes with uh, both strengths of the players and also style. You could see that um, Noderbeck just drags Wesley into fights where yeah. both players make mistakes, like crazy time trouble and everything. And, and, and it is true that my games with Wesley seem to be, for all the for all like my talk about hustling, like my my definition of hustling and others might might be <laughs> different. Different. <laughs> different uh, mine just means you know taking some more right some slight slight risks. Playing yeah. Wesley so many times, having so many games with Wesley, of course. Here, is there any separate preparation or something different for a match like this? It comes to openings, you said you kind of like figured it out a little bit too as well. Is it what goes into that? Um, no, I think you sort of take it one take game. it game by game by game. Because I was thinking about it before before the game, like what what's the first moves to play with right. White, especially. Right. And I've tried everything against him, <laughs> like yeah. in the past, yeah. and you know, it's um, yeah. I think you just have to take it game by game. Wow. Yeah, but, uh, just to jump in on that, uh, the game, the second game you played Black, he obviously didn't play B3. I said when the show started that I thought Wesley would open the match with D4 because if he opened the match with E4, you would play the Sicilian. Do you think if he started the match with E4, you would have played C5 A6? Like, were you ready for A6 Sicilian right off the bat, or is that something you have to kind of? Is that like a game human. three opening? Is there yeah, such yeah. a thing as a game one versus a game three opening? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, no, actually, I think it makes more sense to play, even more sense to play to play it in game one, since um, your opponent may not be ready for a surprise mm -hmm. at that point. Um, but um, yeah, I don't think that would have made a difference. Well, work to perfection today. We wish you the best of luck tomorrow, whatever you're going to do this evening to stay ready. So we'll see how tough a nut Wesley proves to crack if we get a long day or if you take it in two. Either way, good luck. Thank you. All right, nice to see you then. There he is. That was the man, Magnus Carlsen, who took down Wesley So in the first game of our title match, the first set, if you will, of our title match. It was four games in total. And Magnus won by a final score of two and a half, one and a half, as you can see there. And uh, yeah, I, I think, again, like a lot of people say and feel, Levy summarized it in our pregame show. You kind of expect Magnus to do things like this, even if there's a part of you that is rooting for it to go the other way. You want Wesley to have that 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 extra whatever pep in his step that maybe pushes it a little longer. Maybe he'll have it tomorrow and pushes longer, guys. But today it was all Magnus, and right now it's all fan zone. We're going to check in with Kaya because right after the postgame interview, she hustled over, and there you are in the fan zone, and the fans are still live.
They definitely are, Danny. I just had to go check out this place after hearing you guys talking about it. And it's so cool. Like, walking in here, you walk past grandmasters, you walk past the chess fans standing together with them. The atmosphere here is just so cool. Let me... Hey, can we get some love for chess? All right. Yep, yep. I mean, this is just the place to be in Toronto today. It is so cool to be here. Um, I wish for everyone at home that you would be able to join us here tomorrow. Obviously, that's not possible for most people in the world. But I will say this. Call up all your friends, your family. It's a Saturday tomorrow. Get them together. You know, make some good food. Hang out. Watch the drama on the final day of the CCT finals tomorrow. Because this is just so much fun. This is awesome. Back to you guys, Danny. Thank you, Kaya. I agree. Great call to action. Put together your own chess viewing party, party. And, uh, and get involved on social media. It was a viewing party out there. It was it was so nerve wracking. You you had you sweat through your suit. You had to change clothes apparently. Yeah, yeah. I had to go upstairs, grab the coat to get over there for my break, and then uh, and then I realized I had sweat through the first blazer, so I wore black because you know it was a tense yeah. match here today. Right. And uh, it was a, it was a it was a weird match. Yeah. It was definitely it felt it felt like it was just over all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah it, it felt it definitely felt a little bit of apprehension from Wesley. Like yeah. I was watching that whole third game develop in the bar, and when I or whatever, the, 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 the Belfast Love Public House, essentially a, a, a very nice bar. Uh, and I was watching on the screen like, oh wow, Magnus playing a really provocative opening. And then it just kind of was a, was a calm game and I kind of got the sense like, Wesley's gotta go at some point. And he went, but with less than 10 seconds on the clock in a rook end game, which is just about right. the worst time to go right. yeah. versus Magnus, like to step on the, on the gas, so. Yeah. yeah. No, I think actually uh, one thing that I love about these games is that the learning aspect. Like at mm -hmm. home, for me, I mean, I just feel so good watching these end games because now I'm more comfortable to go to end games because you can see yeah. now you're not going to play it like Magnus will, but you're going to feel much better and see, oh, I got an end game. Let's try to, you know, be inspired. Really? To, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be inspired to lose. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like when I look at these end games, I go, well, I would lose that position with either, either side. side. Yeah. That's how I feel when I watch these games. Yeah. But oh, I don't man. think anybody, I don't yeah. think I've ever met anybody in the world who loves chess as much as you. Can man. I just say that on camera? Thank you, man. Thank you. I love how much you love, and he is. He is a student of the that. game, if anyone doesn't know James Canty. But seriously, it, it is nerve-wracking because yeah. I feel like I would lose from either side. But I just want to go back to agreeing. Obviously, Magnus said it, not trying to, to, to pile on even further. But there was something something not so so flexly Sorrento yeah. today, right? Yeah. He had the pawn on E7. There were moments where he could have done it. He didn't. Magnus used his terminology, hustled his way. Yeah. To our first title match victory. Yeah, I right. wanted to ask Magnus before he left. There were, there, there's, you, there's so many things you want to pick his brain on. Mm -hmm. Like specifically that question. I'm not sure I fully got my point across. I might have rambled, but my question was: We had debated what yeah, Wesley's yeah. opening move was going to be, and Wesley showed up and played B3. <laughs> but if Wesley had played E4, yeah, I predicted a Sicilian. He would have. And mm -hmm. I didn't know if Magnus was like ready to play a Sicilian game one, mm -hmm. or right. if that's something you kind of throw on a guy in the third game of a match because you realize you have information just like right. in poker right. from the first two games that yeah. oh he's tentative. Yeah. So if I hit it with a Sicilian now, it might really mess yeah. him up. That's so, very nice. But also that last game, you know, uh, it's it's always fun for me to to see Magnus get into an end game where he's like microscopically worse. Yeah. And Magnus sits down and he's like. Oh yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Well, oh, you think you could beat me? You dare <laughs> use my my own spells against me, Potter? Mm -hmm. And then he just draws it in ten moves, like right. you know. Because if the colors were reversed, we'd be like, "There we go, Magnus is gonna work his magic." But yep. it was over. It was just a draw and not much of a fight. So, I, I said know. something similar to the to the only monitor we have in the building that's not on delay. As I was watching it, I was like, oh, Mac "There he goes, Magnus, just taking the life out of any chances Wesley had." But all right, we've had a lot of life here. There's a lot of life ahead. Remember, this is not over. Wesley So has beaten Magnus Carlsen in matches before, not just here, but uh, in, in Oslo. We're going to talk a little bit more about their full career and rivalry against each other more tomorrow as we all maybe hope for this thing to go the distance because we love content, we love chess. Maybe everybody besides Magnus Carlsen wants that. So, all right, we got things to do. I think I'm going to head over to the fan zone. I don't know about you guys. I got to get there before it's done. But for the whole crew... Canty, Levy, Kaya, everybody working hard here. Everybody working hard in Oslo. Thank you so much. Join us for day two. It's the title match of the 2023 Champions Chess Tour, and we'll see you then. And it is 1v3. Magnus Carlsen shakes his head. He is surprised. First game ends in a draw.
Why is he allowed the black pawn to run? Black's pawn cannot be stopped. But he resigns. Magnus Carlsen does Magnus things in the endgame. It is a draw. Peace on this board, but Magnus takes the set. Set one to Magnus Carlsen. Wesley So has to strike back in set 